Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Welcome, welcome. Give yourselves a hand for being here. So early. Well, we got a great ride out for you this morning. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about how to get more. Who can use more wire leads? Anybody? Right. How about more listing leads? Yeah! And if you realize the mascots of EXP have arrived, my parents, Jim and Carol, go. Come on. They have my parents. They have my parents. They have my parents. Awesome. 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 Parents. All right. Well, we're going to get going. And uh, so take a lot of notes. Uh, I'm up first. And then we're going to have Marguerite come and share some what we're calling rocket fuel, sales fuel for your business. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, have Don Yoakum come up, who is an absolute iconic superstar in the world of real estate. He's going to be talking to you about professional referrals. Now, here's what a lot of you did. You saw the flyer, you're not professional referrals, I don't need that. It's the best source for your business, and you don't even realize it. So, I want to say this today, you're going to get out of this what you put into it. How would you agree with that? In other words, if you sit on the edge of your seats and you take notes and you're looking for gold, you will find it. If you lean back, cross your arms, your legs, and your eyes and go, motivate me, or we'll see, guess what? You probably won't get a lot out of it. So I really want you, I have found that if I'm taking notes, write down everything you hear, and then go to lunch later today and take notes from your notes. So are we ready to get started? Yes. Okay. So one of the things I love about real estate, everyone asks me, well, if you were brand new and you had no mojo, what would you do? And, and if I, you know, you parachute me into Boise, Idaho, Miami, Florida, Denver, Colorado, uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, it doesn't matter. Take questions again. Uh, when we when we go ahead and put me anywhere, I would be doing open houses. That's what I would do. It's the quickest way to eat up and run. Now, a lot of you have gone, well, I've already tried open houses and it didn't work for me. I did the same thing. I wrote it off for two for two or three years. I wrote off the open houses, and uh, I, all of a sudden, I noticed a company that was killing it. A little no name company called John Brooks Realty. Raise your hand if you've heard of John Brooks Realty. Raise your hand high. Uh, three people in the room because they heard me tell the story. <laughs> this it, it is 1998, and they're beating Coral Baker, Remax, and Century 21, and Lions. So those Keller Williams didn't exist back in 98. They were not in Sacramento. There, there were no franchises at all in Northern California. So the big four was Century 21, was a force to be reckoned with. Lions, of course, Remax, and Coral Baker. And then this little company, John Brooks Realty beating everybody on these things called bank repos, out of repos, because we had a big correction in the 90s, just like we recently had, and you know, real estate runs in cycles. And what I noticed was this little no-name company was selling more bank repos, HUD repos, 500 moves you in, than all the big brokerages put together. And everybody wanted to sell them, because the commission was 5%. I was looking at 5% when we sell a house to a buyer. Now the homes were 60, 80 and a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> you guys are spoiled. What, what's the typical house cost now? Anybody? 400, 350. It was two years before I sold a home. I got the luxury market. It was Orangeville, hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars. My first home over a hundred thousand. But we're selling homes at 80, 90, and hundred grand, getting four or five thousand a house. You sell two, three, four of those a month, you're making 10, 15, 20 thousand a month. It wasn't bad. So John Burke's Realty is killing everybody. So what I want you to do, whether you've done open houses with success, or you failed at it like I initially did, I want you to just start fresh and give it an open thought. Now some of you are going, there's no way I'm doing an open house. What if you hired a young superstar um, uh, person, right? A young with energy, right? Like right here, Matthew, right? That, that young man. And, and he's Young. eager beaver, you know, ex-pharmaceutical sales, ex-copier sales, ex-whatever, and gets in the business, he's like, I'm gonna tear it up. He said, here's what you need to do, go to an open house. You know what they're gonna do? Okay, I'm gonna go to open houses. I took that idea, copy John Rich Realty, I'm about to show you how I did it, and basically made $3.8 million in a single year. Is that good or bad? So whatever you did, forget it. I, I'll tell you this, that a friend dragged me to the sushi restaurant at the Art and Fair Mall about 25 years ago. And I wrote it off for 10, 15 years after that. It was not a good experience. 
Now, I'm a, does anybody know anything about Makunis? Right? Love it. I'm a huge fan. You may have tried to open house to sale, but I need to start fresh. Let's get into this. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about how we've succeeded at the highest levels. You don't have to do it. You can have your agents do them. Today, I have 23 agents. I don't provide these to my agents. I've taught them how to do this, and you can teach people how to do it. So basically, how the system works is this. Well, before I get into that, how would you agree with this? If you're really going to do something huge in real estate, you got a master lead generation. Anybody agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. How many of you go on a listing lead every day? It only takes an hour. Why don't you? You don't understand how to do listings and to generate leads. Do you know that people call me every day to list their homes? Every day. I actually stop running the ads because I find it bothersome. It is, is it? How would you like to be in my position? I said, stop running the ads. I don't want to talk to people about listing their $900,000 house. Yesterday I was talking to someone about, I just worked in my bragging with my friend, not bragging with me, but I'm just saying, I was talking to a client, $900,000 sale. He's going to give me 6%, which will keep 3 and a half, whatever, 2 and a half. $30,000 commission. 15 minutes later, James, where's James? Is he in the room? Back right there. 15 minutes later, I'm on the phone talking to this guy. He's telling me about the solar system and how many amps and watts and how it's fills up and James is like, get off the phone. <laughs> Have you ever been in a position where $30,000 is a waste of your time? Anybody? <laughs> Listen up, we're going to teach you how to, but you got to get a little crazy. Who wants to get a little crazy? Anybody? <laughs> All right, there you go. Thank you. Uh, that was calm days. <laughs> Number one Calvary's agent seven times worldwide in the past 20 years. So it's interesting, the one person who screamed. It's like, you got to want it. Anybody got fire in your veins here? Yes. Because let me tell you, you're not going to succeed in real estate if you just kind of lie down the deal, especially the market we're headed into. Yeah. You better dig deep. You better reach deep. Now, here's the deal. If you do it easy, real estate is hard. If you go for it hard and you do it hard, it becomes easy. You get, write this down, you get the big mo. Write that down. That's a technical term. You get the big mo. You get momentum. What do you mean by that? Everything you touch turns to gold. Every time you turn around, you're selling homes, selling homes. What I'm about to teach you works so well for me that I set a goal to sell 30 homes in 30 days. Is that good? Yeah. How many of you should be thrilled to sell 30 homes this year? And you're thinking it's so small, you ever got any great car done? 10 times it. Come on, man. You can do 10 times more, but you're comparing yourself to Bob. And Jenny and Brent, when I was new, I'm like, well, Brent sold two, I sold three, man, I got you, I'm doing good. And you're being competitive, and hey, I'm a rookie of the year, and I got three, and that's where I got four. I know people that sell 1,900 homes a year. 900 homes a year. Because I went to stuff like this, and they said, hey, there's an event happening in Toronto. And I went, and I, I went to events in Las Vegas, I went to Florida, I traveled, I met people that were killing it. And this is when I realized I was selling myself short. So I'm going to talk to you about doing some different things. Now, how many of you agree to set a goal to sell 30 homes in 30 days? Well, Zig Ziglar says this. Number one, you can't hit a goal you don't have. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. And goals create the daily activities necessary. And so you become focused in. Write this down. People are either wandering generalities or meaningful specifics. In your marriage, are you a wandering generality? Or are you taking the time to write a note, bring home a daisy that you picked from a, f a field, a wildflower? Honey, I was in, we did do corny stuff like that. I mean, I actually folded my laundry and brought it up this morning. First time in five months, but I did it, and you're going to hear about it. But, you know, doing the little things, taking your spouse on a, or like, my wife and I are going out tonight. I don't know where we're going, probably Elf and I or, or Rucris or um, Sienna's or maybe Walmart's, but we're going out and we're going to paint the town tonight. You know why? Because that's what we do every Thursday night. And you'll find that you're a wandering generality in real estate or a meaningful specific. You could be a Tomahawk cruise missile. So today is about stepping up, about really kind of picking it up. And so I kind of figured out I've mastered lead generation to the point where I could actually set a goal to sell, I gotta get you out, I forgot, I'll get you out. To sell 30 homes in 30 days. Is that good? So like, how can you guys trying to sell one? You know? And so we're gonna teach you how to do this. And by the way, I'm proud to say that I failed. I'm always up here speaking because I'm I failed. I failed at open houses. That was horrible at open houses. I hated that. I wrote them off for years. I did not succeed at listings for a decade. 
And then I got to the point where we carry 18 to 25 listings. Who would like to have 18 to 25 listings right now? But you try and you try and you try and you do and you do and you do. Like, well, I tried that. I tried internet leads. It didn't work for me. I tried golf and I was terrible too. <laughs> golf looks easy. You watch it on TV. Then you hit it. It goes, <laughs> And then, and the glass breaks. And there's signs. You pay it. You break it. You pay for it. And so guess what? The month I set a goal to sell 30 homes in 30 days, I only sold 14. I told everybody I'd sell 30. I sold 14. My record prior to the big, hairy, audacious goal of 30 months in 30 days was seven. I smashed my all-time record. Double. Is that good to double your all-time record? Yeah. But guess what? Seven, I'm like, well, I ever sell seven again. Now seven became the new norm. You want to stretch yourself outside of your comfort zone so far that the new norm is awesome. How many like it to be normal to sell five, six, seven months a month yourself? So we're going to get into it. So let's get into it. Uh, you desperately need more clients. So basically, my my record from open houses was in 30, uh, I got 37 clients in 30 and a half hours to give me their private social security numbers. Do you collect private social security numbers for open houses? No. I do. All day long. Like, how many of you ever find agents can't even get somebody's name and number in an open house? I remember chasing people to the car in Rancho Cordova because I'm working for a small company 23 years ago called the California Equal Opportunity Homeownership Association. That was my first real estate brokerage. Is that an awful? Yeah. What's your company name? The California Equal Opportunity Homeownership Association. <laughs> Somebody give me some money. <laughs> right? And that was my first company. I worked there for half a year. And, and I remember going to hold open a Cobble Baker open house because my parents worked for Cobble Baker and they gave me one of their listings. Science is Cobble Baker. I work for an independent. And then did I have open house signs as a new agent? No. Did anybody ever borrow signs as a new agent? Yeah. Yes. I borrowed their Cobble Baker signs at their Cobble Baker open house and I held it open and I didn't know what to say to people. I'm like, this is the trash can. This is the seat. This is the backyard. <laughs> like, yeah, we can see that. Just leave us alone. But I'm like, and then they're walking at the door, hey, can I get your name number? I'd love to help you maybe find homes, right? And what do you do? And they're like, no, we got yours. And I keep talking all over the car. And the guy's like, let's get in, let's go. And they're like, let come over and get away from me. And I'm like, this sucks. I mean, open houses, I didn't do it again for years. Um, and so we're going to talk to you about how to do that, how to, how to collect social security. So what am I saying that is so powerful that in the age of identity theft, people say, here's my private social security number. You guys got it like that? By the way, 19 got approved, which means 18 didn't. And I was able to call 19 on Monday and say, congratulations, you're approved to buy a home for back then, you know, when I was doing that, when I did that one, I home prices were like 300000 And you got approved for 500 you got approved for 200 you're approved for 800 And they loved us go shopping. And Sunday morning, I woke up with no clients. And by Monday, I had 19 approved buyers. How much did it cost me to acquire 19 approved buyers? Not even really my buyers. I'm the one who got approved. I didn't even tell them who the lender was. I'm their hero. When you call someone says, hey, you're totally approved, zero down, zero closing costs, up to $500,000, half a million pay any home you want, no water bills, Bolsa, Roseville, Rockland, let's go shopping. No payment for your first two months, up to two months. Let's go shopping. How do you feel about that? What's the interest rate? The, my lender just gave out an interest rate of 4.6 30 years fixed. Depends upon when you buy the house, but 4.6. Uh, by the way, you said you talked to Bank of America. Did they tell you what the closing costs were? No, I mean, that's a huge red flag. Because it could be $15,000. I've seen Lending Street charge $18,000, when my lender did it for nine. So how do you like to have a really low interest rate? How do I do that? And so we're going to get into how that goes here in a minute. But you can build a team or you can go solo. I was able to only learn how to do it, to teach other people how to do it. So again, my experience with open houses, like yours, was probably terrible, hated it, didn't work, and then I saw John Brooks Realty, but they did, I, I was out, and what changed my life was Truxel and Highway 80. <laughs> There's certain moments in your life where your life changes forever. It's Truxel and Highway 80. I'm on um, El Camino in Truxel, and I'm driving down to Camino, and I start seeing these signs, 500 bougie in, free list of area homes. And they're everywhere. I mean, they're sign after sign after sign after sign after sign. And I'm a busy real estate agent going to show property. <clears throat> I get to the intersection, there's two signs at every corner. Eight signs at the corner alone. 
It must have taken them an hour to put these signs out. And I'm not even looking for a mask. I'm like, what, what, what is this? And I just turn like a moth to the flame. And I try and bury it in this subdivision. I get there, there's this many people on the driveway, upstairs, downstairs, backyard, and they're just taking offers on a house in the garage at a card table. I'm like, what? What is this? Oh, it's an open house. I'm like, yeah, I can see the house is open and people are going in and out. I go, who are you? And they go, John Roach Rossi. And I went, oh, the light bulb went on. The company that's kicking everybody's butt because they're being different. There's a marketing genius. He wrote a, a book. I think it's called The Purple Cow. And it's like, what does it take to stand out? He's right up on a train across France. Well, there was a bright purple cow that would get everyone's attention, not like all the others. What do we do as agents? We just do all the normal, boring stuff. So you got to stand out. They were doing, the, I've never seen an open house like this. And I, I had this moment of inspiration. I copied them. I, couldn't, I would spend an hour putting my signs out, start at nine, get done at 10, break a nail, <laughs> twist an ankle, you know. And then I'd sit there until five um, o'clock, seven hour open houses. You meet agents, it's so funny. You meet, oh, I didn't open house today, I'm exhausted. I was, I was out there from two to four. <laughs> it was me. Oh, really? Mine was wonderful. You ever come to yours? No. You ever come to yours? No. Who's depressing, right? You ever done an open house and nobody comes? It's depressing. Why do I know that? Because I was that agent. I've been. I've laid on the floor begging God to send people through the door. Because I was 30 years old, I had a wife with two small kids. You out? I did that. Amo, California, a patio enclosed. You know why people enclose their patio, right? For Fifi, for their cats, and their cat hair everywhere. I'm laying there, get up, and the doorbell rings because God answered my prayer. And someone came over. I'm getting the cat hair off me. Man, I've been there. I've had sucky open houses. But I got to the point where I'd rather do open houses than I won't stand on these. I'd have to stand up and talk to everybody. Well, it's just not like that anymore. Great. Right. I disagree. I know people that have had open houses with 40, 50, 60, 70 people in them last weekend. You just don't know how to do it, okay? So we're gonna get off that a little bit, but basically, I started copying John Bush Realty. And then they are, and the, the, the analogy I like to use is a fruit stand. You ever been out in the desert, or maybe up towards Marysville, you see a sign, peaches, eight cents, watermelon, 15 cents, Fuji apples, 23 cents, and you still, all of a sudden you're driving. It happened, our wife and I, on our anniversary at the Ritz Carlton, half moon day, driving along the coast down to Santa Cruz, fruit stand, strawberries, and all of a sudden, I look at her, she's like, you want to stop at that fruit stand and just grab some, I don't know, peaches or something? <laughs> was I thinking about fruit? Once I saw the signs, was I thinking about fruit? We bought some strawberries, we bought some grapes, we bought some things, we sell some cheeses, and, and we bought a bunch of stuff. The signs were the key. What do we do as agents? We put out five Coldwell Banker signs, seven Telewayne signs, nine Berkshire Athletes. <laughs> And we put up a blue and white balloon because I work for Keller Williams, those are our colors. And if you're a, re a Remax or Keller, you put out red and white balloons. And somehow the balloons mesmerize when you're showing up at the open house. How's that working for you, right? So I put out 25, 30 signs, spent an hour doing what they did. And guess what? By 5 o'clock, people would be pouring through the door so hard. <clears throat> I'd stay till 6. It's now dark. I still come through the door 7. I shut down the open houses at 9 and 9. You know, agents are like, no wonder open houses aren't working. You, you got your teenagers pull shifts at Taco Bell that are longer than your three hour open house. <laughs> and you're going to make 400000 a year. I want to break a chair right now. I think that makes me upset. But that's what you've seen in the open houses from one to four. No, they're not. They're from nine to nine. Well, that seems kind of, uh, kind of, you know, radical. Okay. Keep making your income. Keep driving the car you drive. Yeah, I got radical. On the weekends, I worked my tail off. I got catch church Sunday morning, always did that. But I would literally get going from 8 in the morning and go till midnight. I'd be writing offers at 9, 10, 11, midnight. I've met people at homes at 1 a.m. because the husband was an <clears throat> American Airlines captain in charge of baggage, and he'd get off till midnight at Sacramento International Airport. I'm like, great, I'm coming to the movie tonight. I'll get around 12, 12, 30. Let's meet at the home on Kona Drive, Orangeville at 1 a.m. Do you guys meet show property at 1 a.m.? I do, but I definitely want to succeed. I definitely do. I love to worship at the altar of money? No. But here's the deal. You need a little to pay your mortgage, right? You need, and guess what I did Monday? I was at the zoo at kindergartners. 
Guess what I did Wednesday? I go snow skiing. Guess what I did Friday? I was at Apple Hill with the sixth graders. I was the dad and all the stuff. The Go family coached three soccer, three soccer teams in, in Roseville. There's 3,500 kids, and they couldn't get. We only my wife did what I did, but none of the parents would volunteer for the final little team of like six year olds. So like, what is it? Raise my mind. Yes, we could. And we ended up coaching three teams. We're the only family. Why? Because we had the time to do it. Why? Because on the weekends, I didn't pull around. I was a weekend warrior. I had all my free time Monday through Friday. On the weekends, I rocked it. When are people out who are buying homes on the weekends? Because they got jobs during the week. I snow skied, I water skied, I played during the week. On the weekends, I didn't play at all. So we'll talk about that. So the, but the signs are the key. Sign after sign after sign after sign. You guys barely put one sign in a major artery. It's like, anybody ever here give them blood? Have you ever given blood? And when they miss, then you're like, that's so cool they missed. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me try the other one. And you're like, have this your first time to do this? Well, no, I've, I've been doing this since last Monday. <laughs> I, I've had a miss before. They're poking you and you're like, oh, this sucks. I know I'm a grown man, but I don't like this. And so <clears throat> you do this open house, you go out to Whiny Way or Fair Oaks or Greenback, or you put a little sign out. Me, I would start an ammo at Ammo Panadi at the off ramp. I'm pulling over, dropping signs at the off ramp. Out there, running them for miles out there. Miles! You want to have outrageous results? Start getting a little radical in your life. I mean, if you're a Christian, you want to know the Lord, read the Bible a lot, pray, bring it in. Do those kinds of things. You want to have a good marriage, invest the time in your marriage. You got teenage kids, you need to be, stop being a wandering generality with your children. But be intentional, be focused. It all learns to do it. And then it becomes easy. I, mean, I take my wife out every Saturday night, every Thursday night. Every Friday night, we have a hundred youth at my house. How long have you been doing that? Oh, about 20 years. Every Friday night, come by my house. There's a hundred kids. Lori, is that they pack all the kids? You're at my house every Friday night. Right? We're intentional about pouring into the lives of the kids. Now, so here's the deal. So, but, but the signs are everything. And what that turned into 168 million in sales in a single year. It's not bad. What that turned into, here's what the signs look like. So you have um, the open house sign, must see open home free list of area homes. It used to say 500 moves you in there, but you could no longer do that because of regulation Z. Did I get that right? They will sue your butt. You put 500 moves in. Because then you got to put the language, right, Dave? You gotta put the APR there. And it's hard to change the APR on the printed sign all the time. It's a little bit of a problem. So we got rid of that. They still work really well. Now, if you want to go where you can put Remax, Kevin Williams, Lions, whatever your company's brand is there. But this is the magic. The magic is right there. You ever been in an open house where people pull up and they drive away? Because it was a two story, you wanted a one story. It was either Scooter and the Haiti machine. The second you put free list of area homes on that sign, I was in Santa Cruz the other day. Pull up your home five five houses off the ocean, and it was nasty. And I was about to drive away, and I noticed it says free list of area homes. Park the car, go in, now the guy's got a chance of converting me to be a client. The free list of area homes is genius, but what do we do? Because we're so smart, we put the word EXP. We put the word uh, Remax and Lions. This is Lions Open House with Metro. Your company's brand does not matter. I can care less whether EHP's there, Lions, Remax, but if you want the brand, if you're that kind of person, you can do it. But that is the mother load, this free list of area homes. And then you have a list of homes. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Number of signs, 25 plus, talk about that. The way that signs are put out are critical. I put them out for half a mile. Some people consider they're driving, they're drinking coffee or Starbucks, they're on the phone, they're, and, and it's got to get their attention. The fruit stand people, right, figured that out a long time ago. How, when do they start those signs? Way the heck back there. By the time you get to the fruit stand, you're like, pull over, pull over, I want some fudgy apples. Come on, am I the only one? I guess I am. Anyway, I thought it was great. Now, yeah. so here's the deal. You will lose signs, get over, it's a cost of doing business. My signs used to cost $100 a piece. And we put out like a bunch of them, and the city rose will come and take like 18 of them, 1800 bucks to do an open house. It's gone. Need more signs? to spend another $1,800. Now, these signs that we have here are $2.95. Okay, you lose 14 of them, you can survive the, the financial input there. Corrugated plastic. Uh, buildasign.com is where you go. <clears throat> so, 
You're going to lose them. HOAs will take them. You'll learn, I learned in Gold River that you can't have any other signs but the HOA approved Gold River. And some security cop had all my $100 signs in the back of his throat, slamming them in there. Someone said, hey, someone's taking all your signs. And I shut the door and ran over there. Like, what are you doing? He said, you can't have these there. You get my property out of your thing. Right. I mean, it's the only time I ever kind of felt a little like, I might go crazy on the guy. And he's like, I'm sorry. He's pulling him out. Anyways, anyways, probably wasn't one of my better moments. But I'm like, stay out of the answer. I never went back. Okay, the houses are vacant. That's a critical thing. All the homes I only call, I call Lions, Remax, Cobo, and of course I don't do it anymore. I don't need to. Um, Sotheby's, Christie's, Nick Sadek, um, uh, Mike Bailey over there at Berkshire Hathaway's Better Homes. Hey, buddy, can I hold your listing open? I have all those people's listings open. You mean I don't have to just stick with Lions? No. Do you know that a non-licensed person can do an open house? An 18-year-old who just graduated from Rockland High can do open houses this weekend. You do not need a license to do open houses. Anyone can hold open any house. The brokers say, well, the Lions rules are you don't hold our listings open. And one Lions agent will tell me that. Okay, thanks, call the next Lions agent. Thank God you called. I've got five listings. You can hold my stuff up anytime you want. I'm like, and I keep their number. I make good friends with them. I was able to do open houses in Bolts, from El Dorado Hills, El Grove, um, Wilton, wherever I want to be. Grant Bay, Loomis, Rockton, West Auburn, uh, Penrith, Newcastle. And you kind of pick your market and you pick the price range. What did Nick say that? What can we learn from Nick Say? Raise your hand if you know who Nick Say is. Raise it up. Half the room. I graduated from Del Campbell High School with Nick Say in 19. Well, he graduated in 83, I graduated in 84. His brother Bill. They were the kings of Antelope. And then crashed all their $300,000 homes, dropped to $1,800,000 homes, and is bankrupting Nick and Bill Say that. Nick, out of desperation, out of a need, goes, I gotta move. Buys a tiny little house in Granite Bay. He gets a, a, a social membership. He shows up to every chamber, mixer, wine testing, open house, Granite Bay uh, Country Club. He can't afford the big one, but he just starts showing up. Now Nick Sadik is the number one luxury agent in all of Sacramento. He owns the Sotheby's. He's a great guy, a wonderful human being, because he inserted himself into that price point. And, and he sells, I don't know, 80 to 100 homes a year of like, you know, a million would be low, but a million five to five million. Mo agents are like spiders. They take what comes into their net. Do you do, you sell mobile homes? Well, how much is it worth? You know, maybe. Right? Do you do commercial? Do you sell, we sell like Taco Bell? And we're like, yeah, I sell Taco Bell. <laughs> I mean, I got real estate, I sold a lot of stuff, you know, my couch, my TV, my, I was trying to survive, okay? But you've got to be particular about what you're selling. And if you sell 50 homes at 300,000, you make some money. Yeah. Oh yeah. But what if, because of the market drops and you drop to 100, 125,000, your income drops by two thirds for selling the same 50, you get to this, it's a technical term, and some of you haven't been to higher learning, but it's called it sucks. That's the technical <laughs> term. Okay? So if you can actually go, I'm going to do open houses only in Serrano, only in Loomis. I'm going to become the land person with horses, and I'm going to focus here, and I'm going to dominate Loomis. I'm going to dominate Wexford. I'm going to be the Las Lagos guy. I'm going to be the Granite Bay. I'm going to be the Rock. The Whitney Ranch is going to be mine, baby. And you do your open houses there. Because if you do open houses, in Natomas, you're going to get Natomas clients. If you do open houses in Serrano, you're going to get Serrano clients and you're going to get their friends who, and then your price point will be here instead of here. Nick Sadek went from here to here because he was intentional. He was not a longer generality. He was a meaningful specific. You've got to slow down. Write this down. Work on my business, not just in it. I'll say it again. For our vendors listening, they're all bottom their head in the back. Would you agree? And we have a man in the back from a wonderful home inspection company, he's going to come up and talk to you. And guess what? He's here working on his business. He's not doing a home inspection right now. You're all here. He's the only home inspector in the room. And he helped fund this so you guys didn't have to pay here because it costs a bloody fortune to rent this building. And he wants your business. Give him a hand. Yeah, really. $25 a piece, $50 unloaded is nothing. 
So he would love to do home inspections with you. He should grab his card and throw him a bone. Your title and escrow people, we have Orange Coast in the back, the whole row of them. Give them money on. Bill Mortgage has just bent over backwards to help us, the mortgage company. But you need to do things for people that can do nothing for you. You can give him home inspection after home inspection. You prefer agents that use him. What does that earn you? A ton. You, you reap what you sow. You give to people, and I get it, he may not be giving you listings and buyers, but guess what? If you're a giver, if things just happen in your life. Do things for people that can do nothing for you. If you only do things for people that can do something for you, you're a taker. I'm just going to come straight out. If you, no, seriously, you're a taker. If you're only doing things for people, you're doing it because you want to get something. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but you also need to do things for people, like buy tires for the secretary at your office who's in tears and they're bald and she's got a two-year-old baby, she's been through a divorce, and she doesn't have the money for new tires. And as they say, April showers bring many flowers. It's going to rain here a lot in April, and she's going to drive away with bald tires, and you can be mad for you to go to, come on, let's go to Les Schwab. And you buy her two tires, for 120, 240 bucks a year, you just got paid a commission of ten, twelve thousand dollars. Maybe you got three or four of them, thirty. It's nothing, but you didn't even take the time to notice because you were so busy pursuing your own agenda. Slow down. Todd Duncan, one of my favorite mortgage broker trainers ever, he trains the mortgage broker people. Any mortgage broker people in here? Got a few. You know the name Todd Duncan? Absolutely. I heard him speak at Paul Marks. Ty Ely, my invited me here to speak, and he said a lot of great things. But I remember this one thing. He said, if you will just slow down a little bit and just slow down and take the time to get to know your clients, you will kill it in the mortgage business. I thought about what he said, and he's right. It's the same for us in real estate, same for everybody and all our vendors in the back. If you will slow down, what do you mean slow down? I mean, when they mention their sons in uh, in uh, polo player, and he's in like Europe, what, 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 where is that? Where? Spain. Spain, he's smiling, he's just beaming as a parent. So my son's in Norway. My son and daughter FaceTimed me this morning. I remember right here when she flew to Norway yesterday. Christina, you know my daughter. And they're in Norway. And he's leaving for um, uh, Saudi Arabia. And then he goes to somewhere in India by the Himalayas. And then he ends up in Indonesia. And, and you'll get me talking about my kids. And so find out about them and ask them and become sincerely, not as a sales boy, but because you're a human being. And they see, you know what? They, they start connecting with you because you're a lover, not a fighter, because you're a person who cares. And we start really caring about the client, you have a client for life. And that's what I got. It was worth that day um, where I had to go to Paul Martin's and have this amazing steak lunch that somebody paid for, and uh, it was worth it. And I got, so one thing I can remember about me, and it's helped me, slow down, <laughs> take the time to get to know people. So, call any broker, ask them about doing an open house, they're gonna say no, no big deal. You talk to two or three agents, not to call brokers, you can call agents, and ask them. One of them, you can't get past three. One of them say, yeah, hold it open, but I only did the vacant homes. If there's a search criteria in MLS that says you can vacate with a lockbox. That's what I click, and I do all those. If I want to be down Robert Hills that day, sometimes it was Ricky Ranch, other times it was Folsom. I try to stay around the lake. Around the lake, prices are high. Let's see if you guys agree. Newcastle, high or low? Uh, Loomis, Granite Bay. Folsom, Delaware Hills, Citrus Heights, North Highlands, okay, right? Arden area, you know, I guess, what, whatever. Ugh. Now, but, um, I like new nice, like I'm like old style. Yeah. Okay, so here's the deal. You can target where you want to be, and you can absolutely kill it, and people will say yes to you. And you can do open houses Saturday, Sunday. I didn't Saturday, Sunday close, so busy I couldn't do them Saturday anymore. I had so many clients. You're 9 a.m. I'll show you property every Saturday night for the next two or three weeks. I'm going to find you a beautiful home. Not two, three months, not two, three years, two or three weeks. I will find you a drop dead home in two or three weeks. You're 11 a.m. You're 1 p.m. You're 3 p.m. You're 5 p.m. And then I would watch show property, three to five homes, maybe seven, three to five, maybe seven. They're like, oh, I got 40, I'm gonna go show them 40. They'll get so lost. I decide what homes they see. They give me a list, they got a realtor.com, I find reasons to get rid of them. I'm digging, you know, I'm digging. Why's this thing been here for? It says 365 days, you just go show it. 
well, you know, they had a bunch of cats, and that person moved out, and we, we, we were working on freshening the air, and there was one in my house that was inhabited by eight, now I got off. You know, I, I took it off the list, you know what I mean? I'll just cat people in the room, you're offended, I'm sorry, it is what it is. Now, okay, so, but basically, I would, I would get to the point, and then I'd write off, okay, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, 1, I'd be right off, because he's selling three, four, five months a week, and how many like these that? Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk to you about. How to grip people in an open house? I don't. A lot of you walk up, you hand me your card, I'm Bob, I'm Brent, I'm Karen, I'm Tammy, here's my card. Don't do that. That's what salespeople do at a furniture store or a jewelry store. I bought a new home, I've been buying furniture, they all walk up to you and shove your card in your hand. You go to a car lot, they shove their card in your hand. You go to a boat lot, they shove their Stop it. You're better than that. Um, I'm like, hey, welcome, come on in, I'm here when you need me. Oh, thank God someone's going to leave me alone. Right? And I don't have a signing sheet, I have none of that. They wander around the house, okay? So that's how I greet them, okay? Now, let's see if I can hit the right button here. Here's, so they wander around the house, they're about to leave. I go, hey, you want the free list of area homes before you leave? There it is, right off the MLS deal. Just one line, boom, 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 okay? And then it's got homes. Now you could go, you know, you could, I don't want to sell homes under 300,000, so you could go 300 to a million. Right? Whole list of homes. That's about all I have. There might have been 80 homes. These are all vacant, by the way. And, and when you ask for their information, I'll show you. Well, we, we have your card. I go, well, hey, just so you know, you can't get my list on realtor.com or homes.com or Zillow or Redfin. You know why? They don't publish the vacant home list. You know why? Because criminals would go there and they know nobody's there. They break it and sell all the appliances. Do we agree? I publish it. I've been fingerprinted, background checked. I have every legal right to print this list, and I can even give it to you. And they're all vacant. So who's got a business card on them? I like a business card. Take it. Here we go. So when you give out your business card, I go, here's my business card. Here's a list. You have my permission to go. Go ahead. You take it. That's my business card. You have my permission to go on the property. Go right up to the windows. and look through the windows. Right into their family room. You can go through the side gate, the pool. Take your kids. Go swimming quick. Try it out. Um, <laughs> I say that, they know I'm kidding. <laughs> and I said, if anybody comes, you say, my agent, I'm buying a house, he told me to come here and check this out. You tell them to call me if they have a problem with that. I've been doing this for 20 years, I've never, oh, that sounds dangerous, I might get in trouble. <laughs> That's what I say to you. Anyways, so here, this is, and here's the key words, this is your passport to every property you ever see. If you guys hand out business cards, I hand out passports. Are passports valuable? Yes. I've had people say, hey, we've got the house, call us if you want to make an offer. I'm like, awesome. Who is this? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. We had your passport in our wallet for a year. We liked you. You were different. Oh, I'm different. <laughs> you know? And you're not like all the other, you know, blah, 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 properties. And never stop emailing properties. Just stop it. Stop it. Oh, my gosh. You, you have no value. I go, you can't get my list, but why do I want to make it on this? These people all live in another house. They're making double mortgage payments. And they, they sold their home for 485, they probably bought one for seven. They're making mortgage payments on 1.4, 1.3 million dollars real estate. They're freaked out. That's why you want to buy from my list. They got granite counters, they got pools, four car garages, they're stunning, they're in Whitney Ranch, they're in Serrano, they got views of Lake Folsom, they're drop dead gorgeous. That's my list and they're highly motivated to sell. Would you like to buy a beautiful home from a desperate seller, yes or no? I'm like, well, I don't think that would work. Great, how's your mindset working? How many homes do you sell in a year? Parents to sell hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes. It is what you get out of hell, house like, because I was walking around, where did I put it up here? Oh, here it is. So, anyway, it does work. And then, and then I go, all I need before you leave is your email address, and I'll add you to my list. I publish right down that word. I publish this list every Friday. And I don't know you guys, all week, I go, nope, I only do it on Fridays, and you can go that week, and I'll never go if you call me back. We use the honor system. The homes are all big, you can call them the race. You can use my list and call somebody else. I'm good with it. Yeah, yeah. So they go and give me their email list. And they fill this out. It used to have a balloon there called Remax for 12 years. Then it had Keller Williams there for eight years. Now it's got EXP on the PXP. My application is five by seven. That may look huge. It's five by seven. Everyone got that in your mind? Your letters will want to make it uh, three pages long, legal, you know. 
All it has is name, email, job, years of their job, income, social security number, co-applicant's name, phone number, job, years in the field, income, their social security number, signature, permission to grant for program administrator, authorized creditor is to determine the qualification of a free fire assistance program. I never ask for a social security number. They just write it down on the form. Because they do it at the top. So I grab the form, they go, yeah, here's my email, I write it there. And then I go, so, now I don't want to send you homes at you know, 300,000 and then 3 million. I don't want to spam your inbox with stuff you're interested in. What price range are you in? We go, oh, thanks for asking. We're looking at, you know, four to 600, but we really want to keep it four to five, but we go up to six. And I write, right here, four to 600,000. And I go, now, I met you here at Whitney Ranch. Are you interested in Roseville? They're like Twin Cities. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do Roseville. And then we write Roseville. Then I write, would you consider leaving? Because 12 Bridges, Cotton Madera, it's actually some nicer communities than Roseville and Rockland. Oh, yeah. Know that, yeah, put that down. What about uh, Ammo? No, no, not Ammo. What about uh, Orange Rock? No, no, we don't, no, we're not rural people. Um, um, so then I write down and ask these. I go, Would you do a single story or two? Single story. Would you want a three car or four car garage? Would you want a pool? No pool. Would you want granite? Do you want an update? Do you want a newer home? 2000. I ask them a million questions. Now what, what they don't realize that's happening is I'm building rapport with them. How many bedrooms do you want? Could you do a two or a three bedroom? No, 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 we have four kids. We need a five bedroom minimum. Oh, I have kids too. How old are yours? Oh, no, no, no. I go, oh, cool, man. And we start um, building rapport with them. I don't even know their name at this point. I've never asked their name. All they have is their email address. And I literally said, oh, yeah, by the way, my name's Brent. What's your name? Ricky. Ricky, nice to meet you. And what's your wife's name here? And oh, I'm Cindy, Ricky and Cindy. And for the first time, I write Ricky and Cindy there. I don't say, what's your last name? How do I spell that? I don't do that. It's just Ricky and Cindy. I don't care. I care about them. I don't care what anybody's last name is. The last thing you should get is somebody's name, in my opinion. The second you go, you, they walk in and you go, hi, I'm Bob. Your name is? Claire. You're, you're a salesperson. That's what salespeople do. You don't want to be a salesperson. Uh, I get it, we're salespeople, but you, you're going to produce at a level you've never produced that before. And then I say, now, have you talked to a lender yet? And then they go, well, yeah, I got my lender, my credit union, blah, 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 blah. And what kind of interest rate they take? Well, they didn't mention that yet. What about the code? I go, well, that's a huge red flag. I go, our lender just gave out 4.6, and closing costs used to run about 10, 12,000 on a home like this. He did it for nine. How would you like to get a 4.6 and, well, we really love our lender, we don't want to change. If you take one minute, I put the pen down on the application and I back up. If you take one minute, fill this out, and you simply mention to your lender that you met an agent who's having you get pre-qualified with another lender who says it's good when you build a deck to have three contractors give you bids on the deck. When you remodel your home, it's good to have at least three contractors give you bids on the remodeling and then pick one that's right with you. You mentioned to your lender that you actually are getting pre-qualified with another lender. The interest rate is going to drop. The closing are going to drop. You can still use your letter, but I will literally, if the interest rate goes from 4.9 to 4.6, I'm saving you $30,000 in interest over the next 30 years. That's what that would do. Would you like to save $30,000 in interest? Has anyone ever told me no? Guess what they say? Some of you go, why didn't I record this? I don't know. I record. <laughs> now, so they go, yeah. I go, take one minute, fill this out, and I will call you Monday with your approval. I don't say I'll call you Monday if you get approved. I will call you with our approval. My approval department is liberal and generous. Man, practically everybody gets approved. I'm telling you, and they're like, and they filled out. And I got 37 of these filled out in three and a half hours on a rainy day. It was raining so hard, the rain was going vertical. That day I stopped at Craig and Supply and bought like 60 bungee cords. I brought a separate change of clothes because I dressed really nice and really high end. I brought another pair of jeans and a polo. And, and, and I brought a towel and I literally towel up. I was soaking wet. I locked the front door. I'm in the half bath. And over the next three and a half hours, I must have had 45 minutes, because that was the only open house happening. No, it was, it was like torrential. But I live by my calendar. Stop. Are you going to go house party this weekend? I should really go yeah, we'll house party. No. You dare go house party. You live by your calendar. Grown men and women live by their calendar. Decide what you're going to do, what you're going to do, and do it. Am I going to go here? No. Okay. <laughs> But you can understand. I mean, I'm sorry. You're like, why well, am I making four hundred thousand a year? Really? How many jobs pay three, four hundred thousand a year? Why well, like to be make eight hundred to a million dollars a year? Really? You're just not going to advocate your way there. You're going to work like a dog on the weekends, and you're going to have free time during the week. 
And then pretty soon you do things right, you literally get to do what you want to do. So this is the, the works awesome. And I never, then, then I go, oh, by the way, when they're all done, what's your last name when you fill that out? Then I always repeat their email and their phone number, because they may have written it, always rewrite the email, the phone number, because can you read, how people can read your writing? Yeah. And you'll be able to read there, so I rewrite it so I can clearly get it, because the only I see that, then the next day you've got 20, 30 of these things, and you're like, oh, what did they say? And now you can't reach them, because you can't read the writing. Always read, especially that, always rewrite the phone number right there, every single time. Um, and it'll see. And when they leave, I turn the form over and I write down everything I can think about. <laughs> it was this man wore a tan jacket, had a cool looking goatee, wore glasses, looks like a college professor. I mean, I write stuff about him so I don't forget. You know? right. Yeah, or it was I? Come on, baby. <laughs> so, um, you know, if I was this man, I'd be like tall, extremely athletic, good looking, you know, whatever. I'm kidding. No, I'm not. You're yeah. right. <laughs> But anyways, Don, Don was a, a world champion windsurfer, like ESPN number one in the world, right there. That'll be our final speaker today to hear from him. Yeah. I was a rugby player at Chico State. I learned how to drink a lot of beer. Sorry, Mom and Dad. Now, anyways, so. Um, okay, so I talked about the low interest rate, the low closing costs. You take a moment, fill it out. Take a moment, fill it out, and I'll call you Monday with your approval. Right back up. What about the 18 people who didn't get approved? I go to run it, well, what could they be? Well, if they work on their credit, you know, maybe in about a year, maybe about two years, maybe a year and a half. Congratulations, Aaron. You've got approved, approved to buy a home in two years. <laughs> Everybody gets approved. Right. You just went foreclosure last week. You're approved to buy a home in four years. Congratulations. <laughs> Everybody gets approved. No doubt. No. Sorry, you make it. You come and eat your life together. All right. I, I did that when I didn't know better. So all 37 got approved. Some are approved now, some are approved. I go, you got some bumps and bruises on your credit. Could you use a little help? My lender is amazing. His name is Jeff Compton from Guild Mortgage. I've worked with me. He'll massage that credit report, bring your credit to you buy a home in no time. I mean, it's a year and a half. Did not the last 18 months just fly by? Yeah. How did you be in a position where you could buy a home in 18 months? Would you like some help? Then we say, yeah, I'd like some help. And then I get his database and he flips them back to me. So that's how that works. Um, okay, I can go faster. Grab the phone. Go here. Everyone gets approved. I have these all over the house. I'll have like five or six homes in like good staples and office depot, little plastic things that they'll, they'll, they'll present. And, you, and then I mark down the price because we're not paying that price. We're buying from the bigger homeless. We're going to pay this price. I literally mark it down. This is my goal getting the house for 45. You can't do that. I do it all the time. There's nothing, no reason why you can't do it. I don't say that's the price. This is what other agents would have to pay. I'm gonna help you get this home at 445. I believe I can do it. I can't promise it, but I believe it. But guess what? I get it. I get it. I, I, I can tell you a million and then tell the story. Zig Ziglar says the best salesman or sales story. I just helped someone get a five bedroom, three bath home, 3,000 square foot, fully remodeled in El Colorado Hills on a third of an acre, tricked out for two seventy, two hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars Is that good? Is that good? Yeah. The home is vacant. The relative isn't here to the home. They just like dump it. We don't even need. You'd be shocked. I've had people say uh, it's a hundred thousand for equity. Just let it go back to the bank. I mean, can't even be bothered with this. Really? Yes. And, and so you can get a good deal. Share that. Say I know a guy. You can share the story I just said. These are the vacant. They just want to get rid of them. And I'll give you a good deal. So how to book an open house? I do it on Monday. I call around. You book an open house for that weekend. Saturday, Sunday. Um, no cancellations, too. So I sold the house Friday the fire. Sold the house. Can't do the open house. I go, see you later. I already advertised it. I got people coming from San Francisco to this open house. I'm going to hold it open for backup offers. Um, when I can't find homes I want, I look over the penny list. I hold penny homes open. Why do I not hold penny homes? Are they sold? No. I'm holding it open for backup offers. Do you pennies ever fall out of escrow? Yeah. Yeah. Are we giving the highest level of service to our sellers to hold their home open, even when it's in escrow? Heck yeah, you can't do that. Why not? You absolutely can do it. I told Paul Bonilla, yeah, yeah, I saw you that gorgeous penny in Whitney Oaks for six eighty. Um, you know, can I hold it open this weekend for backup offers in case it blows out? I would like to have one wait right there. He said, yeah, I love that, right? Go ahead. I hold pending homes open. If they said, is this home pending? You bet it is. I'm holding it open for backup offers. Do I put a sign that says, this home's pending, you don't come open, I'm coming, no, I don't put that. That's nobody ever asked, by the way. And so, move around, find your favorite fishing holes. I would go from my favorite fishing hole of all time, the promontory. 
Does anyone know where that is? What city is it in? Colorado Hills. It's right there about Folsom, right there by the lake, the promontory. I remember one time in like an hour and 20 minutes, I picked up seven, eight hundred thousand dollar flyers in an hour. I shake in their hands, I look them in their eyes, and they're from the Bay Area. I, it's like my fit. You remember any fisherman? Like, I love this one bend on the river in the deep pocket. There's big German browns, and it's my spot. Everybody needs a spot. Well, I know what you did. Well, I tried it, didn't work. I tried sushi, it didn't work, right? <laughs> and then now I love it. I, so what? It's like a kid. I tried Spanish, I don't like so much Spanish. No. Okay. <clears throat> So you get so busy, you can only hold them open on Sundays. Then you get so busy, you can only hold them open every other Sunday, then every third Sunday, then every fourth Sunday. Then you're just so busy. I mean, I don't have to do it anymore, but my team does them because they need to make the money. Short-term pay, long-term be the game. It's two to three months to Saturday, Sunday. Two to three months Saturday, Sunday. Two to three months Saturday, Sunday. It's just, it's just a short period. I think you're just doing Sunday. How do you have so many clients you pick and choose? Like, I, I go with a 9-11, one, three, five, and I'm more, we want to go out. I'm, like, I'm booked, I can't take them out. So I'm one the guy at three o'clock, works for a love floor shop, he was a little sketchy. Um, I double booked myself at three. They want to look at homes in Whitney Ranch for 700,000. He wanted to look at homes in, in, in Antelope. There's nothing wrong with him. This isn't, I'm not saying it's a bad person at 350. If you could show homes for 700,000 or 350, what would be about you? So you're trying for your family. I mean, like, well, you, you should serve them. Okay, you go sell homes for $80,000 in some poor neighborhood and spend all your time doing that. You can do that. And that's a good thing to help people. There are other people who would do that. I need to provide for my family. Do you need to provide for yours? Absolutely. So guess what? Um, I targeted the right markets, and so I double booked myself at three. So I called Jerry. Hey, Jerry, we sell number three. Awesome. Exciting. Something's come up. I can't make it. But Sheldon, my partner, he's going to meet you at 3 o'clock at that Starbucks we talked about on the Good Boulevard of 99. Sheldon's going to be there. You don't care who lets you in the house, do you? Not at all. And what Jerry doesn't know is I just did a handoff. Sheldon now has a client for $350,000 down in Laguna. I'll never see that client again. He's running with it. I've switched clients. I've top graded to my client. So I'll double book every one of those appointments and switch and give away clients and take a 25% referral fee. you got to work with some people that I, in other words, how would you like to have so many clients you only work with ones who bring new presents? <laughs> Literally, I'm sorry we're in here from Atlanta. We have to buy a home by Sunday. We stopped by Starbucks. Here's a mug. Here's some coffee. And we just were so sorry to put up this pressure. You know, we can only spend an 800 to a million in coffee dinner, but we have to buy a home by this Sunday. We are, we are so sorry to put you on going like this. Who would like clients like that? <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Here's what you guys have. Who's got a pen? Can I borrow your pen? What's your first name again? Joe. Joe. Don't let me forget Joe. Uh, Listen, this is most real estate in America. The average agent sells how many homes a year? Six. 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 They walk around with this. Does anyone know what this is? It's a test tube. And are test tube babies pretty or different? <laughs> so you, you, you put, they have two or three clients, they put in the top of the test tube and out like a little drop. Hoorah! A sale. And they do that once every two months and they start with that. And they get real estate a black eye because they don't have clients that are get good. You get good if you get a lot of clients. It's like an IV drip, right? You're on that if you're in a, in a meeting, urgent care, or critical care, they put you on an IV. And then and it goes, drop, 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 and then just try to keep you alive. You make just enough sales to try to keep yourself alive. It's like you're on an IV. You want a funnel. You want so many clients, you only have time to work with the very best. The highly motivated, the kind. You guys know, you ever had a client where you go, I should work with this client. You ever had that? Yeah. And it, but it's nine hundred thousand dollars. And then commission's gonna be like, oh, we're twenty thousand uh, bucks. And then and then you work with them and you're like, what was that? Six months later, they're still looking at homes, they're driving you crazy, they're mistreating you. They're saying, no, you come right now from your son's birthday party, or I'm gonna call the sign on the listing, and then they have no respect for you. You ever know that? And you didn't listen to that little voice, and you realize. Even if you're not a Christian, you begin to believe the devil is real. Okay? <laughs> I've made a pact with the devil. I, my client is the devil. And, and you know what I mean. We've never been in this business. So um, we all get bad open houses. I'm not saying every open house you're going to do is going to work. Some are going to flop. Some are going to be a bomb. Oh, well. Um, rain, wind, or shine, heat. I'm there. I'm doing in the summer. And, and, uh, I remember doing the Elk Grove. It's 105. 
And there are homes you couldn't hold them open. So I put up an easy up in the tent in the street. And the sign just said, house, free list of married homes, no open. People with ages, you can't hold this open. I go, go check the front door, it's locked. I'm in the street. Get scrappy. Because if you get scrappy, you get good. If you don't get scrappy, then you hear, don't say. Now, do you get a workout? Follow up the virus. I call them seven times in a day. I'll take a, a FedEx envelope, put some stuff in it, go put it on the doorstep. You don't even have to spend the money. Oh my gosh, a FedEx thing. No, no, no. It's a no from you with some properties. You know, you're just all over it. What do you do when someone won't call you back? I call it the gauntlet call. What's the gauntlet call? If you call them back and, and you say, Ricky, man, I've been calling you. We connected at an open house. And you said you wanted this. I've been saying it. I haven't heard from you, man. I, I've texted you a couple times, called you a couple times. I go, at this point, all I can think of is I somehow offended you. I apologize from the bottom of my heart. I and mean, hopefully you're not in the hospital or you're in a car wreck or something. But, or, and hopefully you bought a house. And if you did, congratulations. I couldn't be happier for you. Way to go. <clears throat> You ever had a client you connected with and they just they go dark on you? Yeah. And I go, so, but I, I, I have to think I must have offended you. From the bottom of my heart, because I really thought we connected, I apologize. So I'm not going to call you again. I will never contact you again. This is the last contact you'll ever get from me. If you want to work with me, here's my number. Three out of ten will call you back or whatever. Four. Three to four out of ten will call you I'm so sorry. I've just been busy. Um, would you show us property this weekend? You resurrect the dead ones. Are you with me? I call it the gauntlet I call. Finally, the magic move. You always um, book an appointment. I say, okay, every every Monday, every Saturday, every 9 a.m., we go out for an hour. Show me properties an hour. I'll show you two or three properties. If they look, they buy. Write that down. If they look, they buy. That's how the deal works. If they look, they buy. Um, I always have extra homes. Maybe they set up to five, and you got one you found at 5.30. It's awesome. You can offer under five. And you show everything that he's off. Go show them one at 5 30. Read it to them, go show it to them. Have emergency backup homes. Be safe, listen to the little voice. Don't go into vacant homes with strange men. Be safe. Um, I'm a big guy. Sometimes I've been in some sketchy parking lots late at night and you see some rough crowd. I put my phone on 911. I'm ready. <laughs> you know? I'm ready. I'm, I'm smart. You be smart, right? Some of my kidnapped little old friend. So prepare the night before for your open houses. We have uh, this training that's done much better at my website, brentgoresources.com. It's called How to Do a Mega Open House. Listen to that. The signs, you know, very inexpensive. 20 turns, five strikes. Um, I don't think that number's updated, so I'm going to switch it. Was this good? Use some information on some attitude. Good attitude. Mom's stuff. It's super desire to win. You just got to have the sheer desire to win. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up our next speaker, and uh, she is going to rock your world. She's going to talk to you about um, what we kind of call, you know, sales fuel, really how to make your, your life hum. Help me welcome the one and only Marguerite Crispella. <laughs> Well, holy cow, if you aren't fired up, then you must be dead, right? Did that work for you guys? Yeah. Brent is so full of energy, it's a little bit of a tough act to follow. So, uh, I'm Marguerite Crystal, in case you don't know who I am, and I'm super excited to be here today and talk to you guys. I'm a little uh, discombobulated, holding a microphone and a clicker at the same time. Uh, but I think I need to actually move it to my, you got my presentation up there? Oh, see, there we go. Uh, and how many of you started your day this morning feeling really good, all excited, ready to go, pumped up, then you went to walk out the front door and you pulled an entire cup of coffee down in front of your dress? That's it. No, that wasn't you? Not yet. <laughs> well, that was me today. So, so here's a few things that I want to talk about today. You know, Brent talked a lot about open houses and how they work and how to get out there and hustle and how to get business. And what I find many times is that real estate agents, I've determined they're pretty lazy, <laughs> right? Like a lot of us are sitting around waiting for business to come to us. We're sitting around waiting for the phone to ring, looking for that magic button, looking for that magic ad that's going to get our phone to ring like crazy. We're waiting to go to maybe one broker to another who's going to give us leads. We're trying to get onto some team who's going to give us leads. We're all sitting around trying to figure out how we cannot work. 
And here's what I'm here to tell you guys. If you have not already figured out, you might have seen my license plate that says no filter on it. So I'm gonna get pretty real with you today. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about what we can do to actually go out and get business. How are you, Matt? Good. And that means that you have to actually get up, get dressed, put on your big boy, big girl pants, walk out the door, coffee on your shirt or no coffee on your shirt, and go out and hustle if you want to be successful in this business. Because how many people are feeling the market shift a little bit? They're feeling the change a little? Some will say, oh no, no, we're all good, right? And I can tell you that I've now been in real estate for 25 years. It's kind of crazy, I can't believe it's my 25th anniversary. I started out when I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh at that one. <laughs> and uh, I have seen every kind of market you can imagine. How many of you guys have been in the business 20 years or more? Right, so we've seen some different markets, right? We've seen good markets, great markets. We've seen markets go really sucky, really bad, really, really, really bad. And there's an entire generation of you here in this room today that have never seen a bad market. You've never seen a market shift. You've never seen a time when, wow, the phone didn't ring. Oh my goodness, I'm not able to get any clients. Oh, all my family and friends are not going to use me right now. You haven't seen that type of a shift in the market. And so everyone wants to like not be called a salesperson. Let me clarify things for you guys. You are in sales. This is a sales job. You are here to sell real estate. Now, I hear all the different terms. Well, I'm providing the American dream. I'm here to help families. I'm here to do all these different things. And yes, that's true. We love what we do. We love the people that we help. We help them find what they need. But at the end of the day, if we don't sell anything, we can't make any money. And while we all look and say, oh, I'm not doing it for the money, how many of you would work a year or more in real estate and not get paid one single penny? Who could survive? Maybe you're an independent millionaire, I don't know. But the reality is, is that we have to make money. We have to sell homes. We have to go out and do the work that is required to help us connect with more people than ever. Because what did Brent say earlier? He said, we are in a lead generation business and if you have learned how to generate leads, you hold the goal. You can do anything you want, go anywhere you want, right? So let's talk about the difference between proactive versus reactive. What I find is that most real estate agents that I know of are reactive. We're waiting for things to happen to us. And when those things happen, now we react. So now we jump. Now we go do this. Oh, something happened with this particular transaction, now we're gonna solve the problem instead of trying to solve the problems ahead of time. For many of you, with the market shifting, you're not sure what to do. Well, now what do I do? How do I sell houses? When you should have been working all along on ways to generate business. Because there's lots of different ways. Brent showed us one extraordinary way today, open houses. Is that the only way to get business? No, there's lots and lots of ways. But that's an important aspect of it, and to get out and hustle. What did a few of the things that Brennan said that I thought were fascinating? He didn't do open houses for just two hours, right? Like we're in an industry where we're like, oh, I'm gonna do an open house on Saturday. Okay, cool, what time are you gonna do at two o'clock? So you get up, you stroll around, you sleep in, you go have breakfast with the family. At 1.45, you rush out to the garage to grab your two signs, you race to the house, you put up your two signs, you wonder why nobody's there. Oh, it's been rough. Time to go home, it's 3.30. <laughs> right? Like, how many are actually putting in, like, the true 40 hours a week? And you wonder why the consumers complain about what we get paid. You wonder why they look and they say the commissions are overrated. Because on average, the agents are putting in very little time, energy, and resources to go out there and be there to help support the consumer. So let's talk about some different ways that we need to be showing up. First of all, there's a big difference between the professional and the amateur. 
And what I find is that the majority of people are amateurs. We show up when we feel like it. We maybe work a couple days a week. We don't go to our regular marketing meetings. We don't get involved in our community. So let's look at some examples of what the difference is between an amateur and a pro. Well, an amateur shows up when we want to. We allow even little things to distract us, right? We do a little bit here, we do a little bit there. Our commitment comes and goes. There are no real stakes in it for us. We dress however we want if we even get dressed at all. We try to copy others. We have a chip on our shoulder. These are just a few examples, right? Schedule-wise, we don't really have a schedule. We work whenever we think we need to work. We don't have an agenda on what we're doing. We have a tendency to blame others and have lots of excuses why things don't work, why things aren't happening. Oh, it's the market fault. Oh, it's my broker's fault. Oh, it's the seller's fault. Oh, it's the buyer's fault. Oh, it's the other agent's fault. Oh, it's the home inspector's fault. It's the lender's fault. <clears throat> How many people can we possibly blame in a real estate transaction? Right? So the difference is, what does a pro do? Well, let's talk about the professionals. When we talk about professionals, I think of people who've been in real estate for quite a while. Not always. There's new people that show up really professional. What I see and I find interesting is when I go to a lot of educational events or go to a lot of things at our association of realtors or marketing meetings and things like that, I see a lot of the same people all the time. The same faces, the same professionals who show up. The same people who are dressed, ready to go, and getting active and involved in our community. So what does a professional do? Well, they have a schedule. They show up every day no matter what. Like Brent said, does he ever cancel an open house? No. When I hear agents go, oh, I'm sniffling. Or, oh, I understand, you guys, I understand children. So when people say, oh, my baby was sick today, I totally get it. We need to make priorities for children. But I raised six children in this industry. <laughs> And I didn't cancel appointments all the time. What I did is I built my life around, I made, my, made sure that my business was built around my life so that I could make sure that I was there for my kids. So are you showing up as a professional? Okay? Um, they accept compensation for their labor. We seek order in our work. We act in the face of fear. We do not allow ourselves any excuses. I know having survived 25 years in the market, I've worked in every single kind of market there is. So I could have given up 2007 8, pretty rough years. Would have been really easy to maybe go find another job or figure out what else I could do. But I'm a full time professional real estate agent. You know, I can't tell you how many people that I've had who did not want to use their friends as a real estate agent because they didn't feel like they were professionals. And people get, oh, I'm so offended that my friend didn't use me. Well, maybe instead of being upset at your friend for not using you, you should look at the way that you're doing business and see if there was a reason that maybe they didn't feel comfortable using you. Are you doing professional presentations? Are you sitting down and doing a buyer presentation and a seller presentation? Or are you treating a friend like a friend and not presenting to them? When my brother wanted to buy a house several years ago, I remember he said, okay, I'm ready to buy a house. Can you send me a link? I said, no, why don't you and Sharma come and sit down with me so I can go through the process? He was a lender. He goes, oh, I know the process. I don't need that. I said, really? Because it's the way that I work. So I would like the two of you to come sit down. Because what would the alternative have been? Now, I love y'all men, but how good are you at communicating information to your wives? <laughs> And I can promise you, if I started giving my brother information, it would not have made it to Charlotte. <laughs> and, I'll, and how many of the situations are the women primarily, not always, the one who makes the decision about the house? So can you see how that situation could have gone very poorly had I not sat down with them and made sure that I explained the process? So are you number one showing up like a pro? Are you being that professional energy and that excitement and being the one that helps them understand the process, or are you flying by the seat of your pants? There's a big difference. 
And which one are you? How would you feel if you went into a doctor's appointment and the doctor's like, oh, came in, maybe flip flops, teeth, you know, tank top, didn't wash his hands. <laughs> so I'll explain stuff to you later. So these are some of the things that you have to pay attention to. Now I realize that people say, oh, well, my clients are all comfortable with how I dress or how I wear or what I do or how I am. And my question is to you, that might work for you. Are you selling as many homes as that you want? Are your clients referring you? Are they coming back to you over and over again? Because if they're not coming back to you, they're not referring people to you, there might be something wrong. And my favorite, favorite book is called uh, QBQ, The Question Behind the Question, by John G. Miller. And he says, when you take 100% responsibility for everything in your life, you will find a way to fix it. If you don't take responsibility, then it will become somebody else's fault and you'll ignore it. So when a transaction goes badly, it's really quick for us to blame other people. But let me ask you this, could you create a checklist that explains to them all the potential things that could go wrong? Yeah. You could come pretty dang close, yeah, right? And so little examples, like I remember when Brett was talking about the $500 down, we used to do this all the time on, uh, back in the day on HUD homes. And so what would happen when you guys talk about no money down programs, 1% down programs. So the consumer thinks, well, I don't need any money down. How many of you even not have done a no, no, a VA no, no? On the VA no, no, they assume that they need no money. Is that correct? No. Do they need an earnest money deposit? Yeah. They need an earnest money deposit, do they not? Yeah. Now, could they get that money back? Yes. But do they know that they need to have the $1,000 or the $1,500 or the $2,000 up front? They don't know that. So what happens? You go, you get the contract, you accept it, you go, okay, time to send your $2,000 to title. And they're like, what $2,000? Well, it's your earnest money. And we assume that the consumer knows. I don't care how much internet information there is, the consumer does not know what's going on, and they're actually looking to us to get our opinion and get, our in get information from us. And that's where our value is. If you guys think your value is simply finding people homes, you're going to be out of business soon. Our value is in helping people understand the process. And so could you take all those little things that go wrong? There's a pest inspection that typically has to be done. Does the buyer know that it needs to be done? No. What if you explained it to them up front and said, I want to make sure that you understand the process. All these things are what make you a true professional as a real estate agent. Making sure they understand, because you guys have a fine line of trust. And here's how trust works. If I explain something to you up front and it happens, you go, oh yeah, Margaret warned me about that. And you kind of relax and you move about your day. But if something goes wrong, what starts to go through your head? What else didn't she tell me? She's not prepared. What else doesn't she know? What else is going to go wrong? What else is going to happen? And guess what your buyer and your sellers are doing the whole time they're questioning you and what you're going to do. So these are some great ways to start really showing up more like a professional. But what else does a true professional do? In front of you guys, you have a success tracker. And we're going to talk about ways to go out and be a professional real estate agent who is proactive about your business. Meaning you're not waiting for anybody to hand you business. You're not relying on anybody to do anything for you. You're going to go find the business. And with the market shifting, now is the time to double down. Yes? They're all on the table? You guys have the success tracker on the table? They're not? Okay, well, Rob will get them to you. So, there should be some copies on the table that you guys can pass them around if you're not using them. So, this is a tracking form that I use in my business every single day. I learned this from the core, if you guys are familiar with the core coaching. And I modified it a little bit for me for real estate. 
And this is the activities that I do every day. So if you guys are trying to figure out what kind of activities you need to be doing, this is an example, okay? And this is ways to be a professional, full-time real estate agent, be proactive about your business, and make sure that you're getting everything in that you need to be doing. So let's talk about the first thing, which is outbound calls. I'm talking outbound, which means the phone actually works to call out, <laughs> not just call in, and it has more features than texting. Yeah. So you have the ability to actually call out people, and your goal in your job is to actually talk to 10 people a day. Now this sounds easier than it is. Many times I have to make 30 or 40 calls or more to actually talk to 10 people a day. So how many of you are actively reaching out and every single day, five days a week, as a full-time professional real estate agent, are making a minimum of 10 talk to's a day? Very few. So who can you call? People, well, I don't even know who to call. So let's talk about people you can call. Number one, you could call regular leads that you have. You could call old leads. I've been actually going through this list of old leads that I have. Oh, what do you say to them? They're like a year old. I'll say, hey, we talked about a year ago, <laughs> and you were looking for a house. Are you still doing that? Is that still on your goal list? Are you still hoping to accomplish buying a house this year? And what's the worst response I could give you? I already bought a house. Right? And that comes from the fact that you didn't follow up, you didn't make the calls, you didn't do what you needed to do. So are you making the calls? So let's take this for a moment. If you guys were the boss of you, which you are, and your goal was to make $500,000 this year, and it comes time for you to write a check to you because you're the boss and you're writing a check to your employee, and you're the employee. What's $500,000 divided by 12? What is that? Which is that about? $42,000. So it's time to write you a check at the end of the month for $42,000. Did you do the work? Did you put in the time? If I were to follow you all around with a video camera today, from the moment you got up to the time you went to bed, what would I see? Did you put in 40 hours of work? Did you put in $42,000 worth of work? So are you making the calls? Who else could you call? You could call family and friends. You could call expires. You could call for sale by owners. You could call your affiliates, your lenders, your title people, your home inspectors. You could call business people, like accountants and financial advisors, CPAs. You could call your heat and air guy. I just got on the phone yesterday with a guy who works for a, a pest company. I didn't even know that pest company existed. And I spent 30 minutes on the phone with him, and at the end he referred me a client. I just randomly called him, because I had to get my calls in. So who are some different people? Let's throw some things out there. Who could you call? Past client. Past client. Painter. Painter. Expired. Expired, we talked about that. Every new person you meet? Who else? Church members. Church members? Personal people you use. Personal people you use? People that are parents of your kids' sports teams? Then all of these calls have to be, hi, I'm calling to see if you're interested in buying some real estate. Yes. <laughs> they can be. Or they could be, hey, how are things going? What can I do to help you? How can I help you improve your business? How can I refer people to you? Is there anything I can help you with? You could be talking to a painter and he's like, yeah, man, I'm super busy. I'm looking for someone to hire to work with me. Now if you found that painter somebody to work on his team, you think he's going to help you in the future? So what are you doing every day to make outbound calls? I block out two hours in the morning. I sit down and I make my calls. I keep my little journal and I make notes to it. I actually put who it is. Are they a lead? Are they an affiliate? Are they a client? Did I text them? Did I talk to them? Did I leave a message? Y'all can see my journal. It's sitting right over there on the table. 
Are you making the calls? The next step is what's called face-to-face. -face. The goal of any phone call is to make an appointment, to get in front of them. So how many face-to-face -face meetings are you doing a week? For me, this counts as 200. <laughs> right? What are you doing to get in front of people? Now, it doesn't have to be one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one is great. But could you do a home buyer seminar where you get in front of five people at a time? Could you do an open house where you get in front of ten people at a time? Can you get creative and find ways to do more business by getting in front of more people? Here's what I can promise you guys. If you do even one-tenth of what's on this list, your business will improve. If you do one-tenth, but if you want to double your business or dramatically improve your business, start by being proactive. Start by putting the energy and the effort into your business. Why did Brent do 18 sales in 30 days? Because he put it out there and he did the work. He didn't just put it out there and say, oh, please, 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 someone send me 18 transactions. <laughs> he got up, he did open houses, he made the phone ring, he got out and hustled. And some of y'all are a little afraid to hustle. So getting in front of people is key. What does break bread mean? Break bread means that you're going to take that relationship to the next level. So a face-to-face -face person, somebody that you've gotten in, re in relationship with, somebody that you're working with, what I can promise you is when you break bread, when you go and you have lunch with them, or coffee with them, or dinner with them, the relationship and the conversation takes another deeper level. It goes from beyond just selling real estate to what's going on in their life. How's their family? How's their, what do they have to do for fun? What are their goals? What are their dreams? What are their visions for themselves and their family? When you sit down and have a meal with somebody, your conversations always go deeper, do they not? It becomes more about the person as opposed to the business. And again, in order for us to survive in this industry with all the disruption that's going on, what will keep us alive more than anything are the relationships that we have. The relationships we've built and the people that we've connected with who trust us to help with the biggest financial decision that they're going to make in their life. That's a pretty powerful place to be. It's a pretty amazing place to be when you've helped people time and time again. So what's the next thing? This is all again, pre-active. Events attended. This means getting out and participating in events, not just real estate events, while well, we all love for you to be here. You need to be going to events where you can earn business. It could be charity events. It could be chamber mixers. It could be your kids' school events. You can host events, put on events. I personally love to have parties. So we have parties all the time where we have events. We have uh, take your realtor to lunch day where you can take a real estate, you take your client on their birthday, you call them up and you say, hey, I'd like to take you to lunch today. Do you want to invite five or six of your coworkers? So they bring five or six of their coworkers to lunch and now what just happened? I got five or six people I can talk to about real estate. Because how do you think they introduced me? Guess who's going for lunch today? Our real estate agent. <laughs> so what do you think the topic of the lunch conversations are? Gosh, Marguerite, what's happening in the real estate market? Can you tell me what's going on in Roseville or what's happening in Rockland or what's going on over here? Should I sell my house? Should I not sell my house? Is it a good time? Is it a bad time? Guess what? I just got to have five face-to-face, -face, five break bread, five conversations about real estate. Pretty powerful, right? Leads generated. How many actual leads did you generate during your time that you're prospecting? If you're talking to somebody on the phone and they say, hey, I want to tell you about my sister-in-law. She's thinking about buying a home. That counts as a lead. You talk to that client and they say, yeah, I'm thinking about buying next month. That counts as a lead. Are you even tracking your leads? I posted in my Facebook group yesterday and I asked how many, I asked all the agents, where did your last listing come from? And I had 25 people respond, 24 of them said sphere of influence. So why are we spending so much money in advertising? 
Why are you spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on Zillow and Realtor.com and Homes Magazines? When the majority of you, if you would just put a little tiny bit of effort into your database, if you have one, if you don't have one, I'm gonna hunt you down. It's the most valuable thing you own. I'm talking about that tomorrow at the Plaza County Association of Realtors if you guys wanna come. But what are you doing right now to stay in contact with those people? The majority of your business is coming from your database. But why are you not being proactive with it? How can you be more proactive with your database? How can you be more engaging with them so that you can do more business out of it? So what kind of events have you been doing? What kind of leads have you generated? How many leads? Because what I can tell you right now is that I can tell you exactly where your business will be 90 days from now if you just show me your numbers. The beauty of numbers is that they don't lie to you. They don't lie. So if you're not closing as many deals as you want to close, it's nobody else's fault but yours. And these are some simple ways that you can reach out. How many hours did you actually spend prospecting? Hardly anyone has a regular schedule for actually reaching out and prospecting every day. I remember back in the day when I first got into real estate, uh, I worked at, there was an old Prudential office over there in Roosevelt, where my first office was. And every morning when I would come into the office, there was this guy named Tom. And Tom would literally, not Tom Bates, but he's here too, but Tom I know does this for a fact, is every day, I would go in and he had a sign outside of his door, do not disturb under any conditions from 8 to 10 a.m. Like if there's a fire, don't call me, don't interrupt me, call the fire department. He literally locked his door, no one was allowed in, and the guy sold 100 homes a year. Every day, without fail, made his calls, prospected, did what he needed to do to get business. So when you look at the top people in the industry, what I can promise you is number one, they show up as a professional real estate agent. Number two, they do the work every single day. They put in the time, the energy, and the resources to get the business. They prospect every day. They're very simple creatures, most of us. <laughs> they have a very simple routine. They do the same thing every single day. They're not flying by the seat of their pants. They're not out there trying to do a million different things. As Brent said very clearly, very focused on what it is they're doing. Very focused. A single focus. So what are you actually doing? Are you sending out thank you notes? Are you being grateful? Are you helping enough other people get what they want? When was the last time some of you ever even wrote a thank you note? <laughs> You know, I still get excited about mail now. There was a time when we got lots of junk mail, right? But now we don't really get a whole lot of junk mail. So aren't you so excited when you get a birthday card? Yeah. Like, I'm so excited. I get one every year from Southwest Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so excited. It's an actual real card. Like, I have to open it. It's so cool. But for many of us, we're not sending little notes or thank you cards like they're few and far between. We're getting so accustomed to the way that we're communicating with text messaging and social media. Like yesterday, I think the whole world about had a panic attack when Facebook was down for a little bit yesterday. And if you guys tried to get on there and you couldn't comment or you couldn't upload something, people were literally freaking out. Like, is this the end of the world? Facebook went down. They're like, oh my gosh, I can't like my friend's post. I was like, maybe y'all can pick up the phone and call them. <laughs> How are you doing? Right? What's going on in your life? What's new? Like, I think it would be hilarious if they just completely shut it down for a few days and see what would we do? We'd all have panic attacks. So are you sending thank you notes? Are you sending any kind of mailers? If any of you guys have known me for a while, I have mailed to my database every single month, good old fashioned snail mail, for 25 years. I said a little story about me and my life. I don't send real estate information. I don't send what's going on in the market. I don't send statistics. I don't send anything that because the people in my database know me, like me, and trust me. So to hear a little bit about my life, if you want to see any examples of that, you can go to marguerite.crystal.com and click on the blog, and you can see some of the letters that I've written over the years. 
So on here, you can see, if you guys look at the one in front of you, there's a point system because real estate agents are a little competitive, are they not? And so you can give yourself points, as you can see, for each of the activities that are on there. You want to get really good? Share it with somebody else. Let somebody else know that you're keeping track and that you have points and you want to know if they can hold you accountable. What are some ways that you could start reaching out? So let's talk about ways of who do I call? Who do I reach out to? You can do things like talk to accountants, appraisers, architects, auto sales. One of my best referrers is a guy who sells RVs. He's like, there are all kinds of people. What do they want to downsize? They're, you know, empty nesters. They're going to sell their house and buy an RV. He refers me all kinds of people. Would you have ever thought an RV salesperson would have been one of your top referrers? Uh, catering services, chiropractors, college friends, community boards, consultants, counselors, credit advisors, your daycare, insurance agents, as Don said, house painters, photographers, physical therapists, piano lessons, pizza shops. See, so many of you have been doing the same thing the same way for so long, and you're wondering why you're not getting different results. This is a long list. Could you add names to this list? All kinds of stuff. Scientists, scouting, temporary help, tennis clubs, tire services, UPS drivers, veterinarians, water company. This is just a small list of all the types of people that you could call and you could reach out to. We are in a relationship business. We're in a business where our goal and our job is to build and develop as many relationships as you can. So that someday you don't have to work as hard. So that someday you can relax while your phone is ringing and sending you tons and tons of business. These are just a few of the things that you can do. You get a picture of that? There you go. So these are some examples that we just went through face-to-face. -face. Listing appointments are considered face-to-face. Face. Buyer appointments are considered face-to-face. -face. Showing homes is considered that. Meeting with people who can give you business. So when I hear people say, oh, I got face-to-face -face this week. I had lunch with my friend who's a real estate agent. Is that real estate agent going to give you business? If not, they don't count. But one other huge resource are real estate agents around the country. If you're not attending things like Brent talked about, Tom Ferry events, Craig Proctor, different trainings, uh, Brian Buffini, all these different things, and don't do it here, go somewhere else. Even if it's just an hour drive to the Bay Area. Are those great ways to meet other agents in other markets? They can refer you business? Six deals last year came from out-of-area referrals for me. One is only an hour away. She lives in West Sac. She doesn't want to drive to Lincoln. So okay, I'll give you a referral fee. She was thrilled with the referral fee, and then when those clients referred somebody, I sent her a referral fee too. So she's earned a significant amount of money this year for me. She doesn't have to drive to Lincoln. She's like, okay, awesome. Visiting builders and business people. There's a thing called the milk route, if you're not familiar with that. A milk route means that you create a list of people that you call on on a regular basis. My brother, after his wife died of breast cancer, moved to San Diego. And he didn't know a single solitary person down there who was in real estate. So he put, developed a list of attorneys. And he picked the top 20 attorneys that he wanted to work with. And he called on their office every single week without fail. Got to know the receptionist, figured out how he could get in to meet with the attorney. He got involved in the attorney network, and he did $26 million his second year down there in real estate. Exclusively from his milk route, from just going out and calling on attorneys every single week without fail, every week. We have examples of that. Title reps do it here in our area, right? Call in offices, check in, see how people are doing. Build relationships, get to know them. That's a key component, is it not? 
So break bread, we talked about that, deepening, deepening the relationship, breakfast, lunch, dinner, coffee. I have a gal who's in Chicago, Illinois, who's on my team. Every Friday she goes and sits in a Starbucks and she lets everybody in her database know that anytime they want, she'll be there every Friday, they can come just ask questions about real estate. She sits there and she talks to people all day long. She has a little sign on the back of her laptop. She has all kinds of people coming up and asking her questions and she's got a ton of business out of doing just that every single Friday without fail. Making it happen, again, attend, events attended and hosted. How many leads have you generated? How many hours did you prospect? Did you send out thank you notes? Did you do any kind of mailers to your database? Maybe you did a mailer to a particular area. And so this, this is where we start to track our results because we're in a results business, right? We get paid by the efforts that we put in and we get paid on the results. So if you're not making the kind of money that you want to make, then you're not necessarily putting in the effort to make that happen. We don't get paid by the hour. We get paid by the results. By, we get paid on results for the efforts that we put in. So what did you do to make it happen? How many buyer listing contracts? You can write at the end there. You can write your escrows and contracts. And instead of closings, I like the word better celebration in most situations, right? We love to celebrate with them the fact that they sold their home or bought another home, depending on the circumstances. <laughs> so what are you doing to actually track the results? It's super easy, you guys, to really track your numbers and to create that consistency in your business. If your business is not hitting the levels that you want, it's because you're not doing the work to make it happen. And if you simply look at your numbers, you'll quickly see where you need to put in more effort. And it helps you create a schedule for yourself and for your business. And so I am doing a class. If any of you guys are interested, I'll be doing an eight-week class called Sales Fuel, where we actually track and hold you accountable in this. If any of you guys are interested in that, you can go to realestatesalesfuel.com and put your name in the interest list. We do charge for the class a couple hundred bucks. I promise you, if you do the work, you'll make at least 20 tons of it, if you're interested in that. But this is just a few ways that you can be proactive with your business right now and put in the effort, put in the work, and put in the time. If you're struggling with getting that done, get an accountability partner. It could be anybody. It could be someone in your office. I don't recommend your spouse. <laughs> it, could, it could be someone you know. You could sign up for the class if that's something you're interested in. It could be your lender. It could be anybody that you want. But what are you doing and what are your goals for this next year? I love when people say, oh, I'm going to do 500000 next year. Great, what did you do last year? Oh, I sold like three houses. <laughs> okay, now, I'm not going to crush anybody's goals. I really encourage you to do that. But are you willing to put in the work associated with that? Because $42,000 a month comes down to about $10,000 a week. Or $2,000 a day. Or a little less than $200 an hour. What is it? 100? I can't do a little more than $200 an hour. So how many of you are doing $10 an hour work instead of $200 an hour work? That's the real dilemma. That's the stuff we have to look at and be excited about. And maybe your goal isn't to hit $500,000. Maybe your goal is to hit $100,000. Whatever your goal is, the beauty of this real estate industry is we can develop and be whatever version of success we want to be. For some of us, that's only selling six, ten homes a year, doing it around our family schedule. For some, it's a hundred homes a year. For some, it's two hundred homes a year. I know for me, when I first got into real estate, my first goal was to make more money than my husband. <laughs> my second goal, I know I'm a little competitive. My second goal was to sell hundred homes a year. I did that my third year in real estate. Then I said, okay, how can I do two hundred? How can I get on this list? How can I get on that list? Now, my goal is to not sell as many homes, but to spend more time giving back and spending more time with people like you. So that's really all I have today. If you're interested in my class, you can go sign up. Otherwise, we've got an amazing speaker following me next. Brent, are you coming back up? Yes. All right. Thank you guys so much.
All right, welcome, welcome. So real quick, I'm going to have Dennis come up and from United Home Inspections. I say that right, Dennis? No, it's all right. All right, he'll, he'll get it clear. Help me welcome, Dennis. Give him a hand and stand up real quick. Stand up, stand up, move around. But I want Dennis to say, please give your full attention. Thank you. Um, gosh, what great speakers. Marguerite, I love your checklist. We call that a KPI checklist. We call that a KPI checklist. Um, Brent, I don't know if you know this. December 2016, I sat in one of your webinars okay. for this company called EXP. I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, what the heck is this? Wow. I, 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 you guys are killing it right now. The energy in here is fabulous. I love it. So I want to talk about inspections. I do want to talk about the industry. We have what we call, you guys can sit down if you want. I don't know if you want to stand up, clap, whatever, it doesn't matter. We have what we call Senate Bill, actually it's an Assembly Bill, AD 1024. Has anybody heard of that? I didn't think so. It is a requirement to license inspectors in the state of California. 24 states are currently unlicensed. California's next. It's going to pass this year sometime. So they're going to start placing requirements on home inspections um, and home inspection companies to license their guys. So keep that in mind. 2022. Yeah, pros and cons. I think that's great. It'll raise the bottom feeders of this industry up a little bit. So we have a little bit more professionalism across the board. I'm excited about that. I just don't like the ceiling that they're going to put on us by how we inspect. But we'll get over that. It's not a big deal. Um, I think it's good for the industry. So since there are no guidelines to an inspection, how does an inspection company inspect? Well, you got to create your own guidelines. So just make sure that whoever or whatever company that you choose that they are associated with an association, California Real Estate Inspection Association, ASHI, InterNACHI. InterNACHI is who I certify all my inspectors through. Everybody's got to have a code of ethics, standard of practice, and a technical background of these minimum. Then we have continuing educations throughout the year that are a mandatory requirement for me as a business owner. Once again, since there are no guidelines. So just keep that in mind. I'd love to earn your business. We would love to earn your business. Terry and I are back there for the rest of the morning, I guess. And uh, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Brent, as always, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Dennis, give me a hand, And honestly, don't just say, yeah, great. Get his card, throw him a bottle. Let's, let's not just be takers, right? Let's say thank you and be givers. So, by the way, on your table, if you haven't seen it, is results faster by 2020. He is the coach to the Fortune 500 CEOs in America. Like who? Oh, like AT&T, uh, Goodyear, um, I mean, Coca-Cola Corporation, Disney Corporation. He coaches the CEOs. So we gave you a little booklet by him. Fantastic guy. Make sure you read that. Okay. We are on the home stretch. And, and I just talked to Don. He said, we might get you out of here a little early. So we're doing good. He is going to talk to you about the secrets of the wealthiest people in the world and how they achieve their success. He's one of the most successful people I know. Help me welcome to the stage, Don Yoko. I am going to share with you what the most successful people do. And I just want you to think about what you observe about them. Are they not also the most connected people? Right? So before I do that, though, I want to... Where, where do you want that money? Right here? Right there. I just want to acknowledge uh, Brent's message about the open houses. How many of you were sweating bullets over putting out 25 signs? <laughs> so a few weeks ago, we had an event in Portland, Oregon, which is where I live. And it was called The Gift of the Shift. The speaker for that talk was uh, Daniel Beer, Kyle Wilson. They are putting out 60 signs. Okay? Now, talk about successful people. Those, those two guys run two teams, and they both do over $200 million. So come on, they're doing over $400 million of business. Yeah. Now, I'm going to put a little 
partner on that. They only do it for the first open house, right? So they make a big deal. What, does my sound okay? Yeah, it's working. Okay. But uh, what I notice is that the people that make a lot of money, they go big, they think big, and I just want you to be aware that when Bert's talking about doing 25 homes, that's, that's a lot, okay? And there's people doing more. So just follow what those successful people do. And also, I want to, Marguerite put something up there that really resonated with me. Brent mentioned that I, very, very long ago, was a professional athlete. And so, Marguerite puts up on the screen what's the difference between being a professional and an amateur. Uh, which I took a picture of. I did because I'm trying to make for my son right now because he's aspiring to be a professional athlete, a water polo player. And so what I decided I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a list. I'm going to make a list for him. He's in Spain right now on what it would look like to show up as a water polo player as a professional versus as an amateur, right? So because Marguerite did that. I feel a little stronger connection to her because she's now going, has done something that is going to now trickle down to my son and who knows, maybe he'll make the difference between him being an amateur and a professional. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And what I want you to think about that and, and why I share it with you is because when you have your communication with your sphere of influence, like Marguerite has suggested that you do, I want you to come from a place of being a professional resource. Don't just call them up to make a little chit chat, establish rapport so you can, oh, by the way, then. I want you to be of real value. Okay? So, my talk is on networking your way to success. One of the first things I want to point out about this style of business is your clients will be nice and they will tend to be more loyal. Do you have any loyalty issues with internet leads? Okay? So what I want to introduce you to is a way of doing business where the people will generally be kinder because people have come to you by referral and they don't want to offend the relationship for which that referral came. And they will also tend to be more loyal. So I love that on both counts. I also want you to consider the way that you're going to show up in this business. And I'm going to go further and say that if you don't show up this way, you may not be in this business in five years. Okay? I'm suggesting that you show up in a relationship-based way the alternative is transactional. If your customer comes away from the deal feeling as though they were a number in your system, then you're doing business in a transactional way, they won't do business with you again, and they certainly won't refer you. The next point I want to share is about leading by example. Everybody's heard about you want to give in life what it is that you'd like to receive. Who wants a referral? All right. All right, start by giving them. Before you embark on this professional referral approach, one of the things that I really want you to do is examine whether or not you're really referral. Okay, so how do we determine that? Number one, do you show up on time? Sheldon Steele today was here 15 minutes early, right? This Lombardi time, right? And I know I've done several meetings with that gentleman, and he's never been late to a single meeting. So I know that if I were to refer an El Grove client to him, that he's going to show up. Okay? If someone that you know 
habitually shows up 10, 15 minutes late, are you going to be comfortable referring that person? Absolutely not. The next point is, do you do what you say? Everybody's heard, we want to under-promise and over-deliver. I would go further in telling you that people will do business with you if you do what you say, if you meet their expectations. They will continue doing business with you. Uh, well, actually, to Marguerite's point, if you do stay in touch with them as well. They won't refer you, though, or it will be a great exception. In order to get referrals, you're going to have to exceed their expectations. As a matter of fact, you might want to write this down. I would go, I would say that your referrals will be in direct relationship to the amount that you exceed expectations. Next point is, can you be trusted? And the way that it's articulated here is, do you finish what you start? Are you a quitter? When the going gets tough, are you going to be there to solve the problems? You know, one of the great benefits that we have as a real estate industry is there's an incredible amount of friction in the transactions. Every transaction is unique. It's sometimes complicated, sometimes troublesome, there's issues with the property. And one of the things that we can be grateful for is that there are problems for us to solve. And what your referral source needs to know is that when those problems arise, that you're going to do whatever it takes to get it done until it's done. Fourth point, do you do, uh, do you say please and thank you? Marguerite talked about handwritten notes. One of my disciplines now is that I mail a card, usually with a book that's been inscribed once a week to some, a, a friend or a colleague. Okay, so it's just a practice that I do. How many of us appreciate getting a personalized handwritten note at home? Right? Whatever the repetition is that you choose, I really just want to encourage you to choose something and start small. Right now, I, don't, I do do occasionally more, but right now I've just committed to myself that I'm going to do one week. Okay. I know some people that do three a day. Do something. And just be sure that you're acknowledging people for what they're doing for you, and you'll find that that puts you in a place where you can be referable. All right, last point on referability. Are you the best at something? So I'm mentoring an agent in Portland, Oregon, and uh, this guy's voicemail said, uh, I, uh, you know, thank you for calling. I won't mention his name. Uh, I, uh, I sell real estate in Oregon and Washington, and we represent commercial property, and we also can do international homes as well. And I think to myself, oh my gosh, you know, uh, this guy is basically saying that he is not the best at anything. <laughs> and, and therefore, in my mind, not referable. Okay, so in this area, sometimes I'll ask people, okay, well, what's an ideal customer for you? They'll tell me, well, somebody that wants to buy or sell in Sacramento, Placer County. How many agents are there in Sacramento, Placer County? It's about to have 6,000. Yes. And Placer County, I don't know. Three or four? I don't know. 
Okay, so Sacramento Placer County has somewhere between eight and 10,000 agents. Okay, so if you're a specialist in Sacramento Placer County, you are one of eight to 10,000 people. Okay, that's not being the best, that's 8,000th place. Okay, one of the things that is counterintuitive but true is that the more that you focus, I think a geographic area is a fantastic way to do that. By the way, according to NAR, either the number one or number two reason why a consumer will choose a belief trust is actually number one, but number two is global market knowledge. So what I want you to be able to work on and articulate is when somebody asks you what it is or what would be an ideal referral for you, please don't say a buyer or seller in Sacramento, Placer County. Okay, have a niche, be the best at something, because so few people do focus, it will be so easy for you to separate yourself from the crowd. All right, one of the secrets of these wealthy people is that they are connected. One of my dear friends, back row, Mary Lou Oates, of course, goes title, who taught me a lot about doing business, is a great connector. I have... Oh, no, he, he is also. Oh, is he connected too? All right. And he's got a reason to that. So, the thing about Mary Lou is that I have a hard time getting out of a meeting with her and having her not try to connect me to somebody that I can be of value to and they can be of value to me. Okay? So what you want is you want to gain a reputation as being one of those people. And you want to be one of those people. Okay? What does it cost you to be a connector? There's no expense. There, there has to be a trust relationship there for sure. But it's an incredibly valuable thing. Marguerite was talking about calling a CPA. Do you know that the average CPA has 500 clients? Can anybody tell me how frequently people move in years? Once every 10 years. Once every 10 years is a pretty good guess. All right. So the CPA has 500 clients, and by the way, if they use the CPA, they probably own a home. People move every 10 years. You see how a CPA has a client listing their home for sale every single week, not counting income property and second homes. And if they own a home, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to go home after that. So one CPA, in one CPA's book of business, there is about 100 transactions occurring per year. News alert, you're not gonna get all those deals. Okay. But is anybody getting even 10 deals a year from a CPA? Okay, no hands. What I can tell you is if you train a CPA properly, and you connect them to other referral sources, I, I do know of many people that get more than six deals a year from a CPA, okay, and you could too. They are the most trusted real estate resource in our community that has the consumer as a customer, okay? But a couple little things, just if you're gonna now choose to go after CPAs, they have to wanna grow their business. Otherwise, it will not be coachable, is what I have noticed. When you go to the CPA, have you noticed how they will ask you, did you buy or sell home last year? Or it's on a little checklist. Now, that's great, and that enables them to file their, your taxes properly. How many people have a CPA that ask them if they are going to buy or sell a home in the coming tax year. 
Show of hands. Okay, do you notice that there's no hands going up? It's because 98% of the CPAs do not ask that question. Yet, if a CPA was going to do anything to mitigate your taxes, ought they know about that taxable event before it occurs? So it would be a good thing for them to do and to ask. But what you want is you want them to ask that question because you want them to follow up a referral. Okay? So that's a good start. They want to grow their practice. You train them to ask the right question. But I'm here to tell you that they also have 12 real estate agents as clients. So how are you going to separate yourself from those other 11? You're going to connect them. You're going to ask them or her their best referral source. It's probably, by the way, a financial planner or an attorney. <laughs> and you're going to ask them where they have a weak link. By the way, you're going to be asked to be introduced to their best referral source. And you're going to fill the weak link for them. Okay? What I've also noticed about the people that I've trained at professional networking, the ones that are the most successful, they end up creating their network as a quasi-mastermind. All of us have heard, you know, read the book, Think and Grow Rich, have a mastermind. What I'm here to tell you is that group is not enough to ask them for referrals. It's not enough to train them. You're going to have to meet with them with some regularity. It could be monthly or quarterly. It does not have to be breakfast every week, by the way. And other groups out there that do that, I think that's overkill. But you will need to ask money with them at least quarterly. If you facilitate it, you'll be a bigger win. Next thing is, you want to coordinate events with them. How many of us, if we went to our spheres of influence, could fill movie theater with our clients? Not too many. Could you? I love it. That's impressive. So, for those of us mere mortals, I recommend you team up with these other affiliates. And I'm going to show you the ones to align with to do events with them. Now, coincidentally, you're going to be the only realtor in the group. There's going to be 25 other professionals inviting people to this event. And by the way, it doesn't have to be the movie. It could be an event at the park. It could be an educational event. But the point is, is that you've got 25 professionals with about 200 people and their sphere of influence. That's 5,000 in total. And you're going to be the only realtor there. Some of the clients might be realtors, but you'll be the only professional in that group. Service. I told you a few moments ago that in order to get referrals, you are going to have to exceed expectations. What I said was, if you meet expectations, if you do what you think, people will continue to do business with you. That is not a high enough bar to get referrals. In order to get referrals, you are going to have to exceed expectations, and to the extent that you do, will determine how many that you receive. By the way, just a little side point on that. One of the things that you're going to encounter if you do adopt this practice is you're going to run into affiliates that are going to say, you're going to run into affiliates that are going to say, well, my role is to take care of your customers. And I'm going to do so with extraordinary service. What I'm here to tell you is in a referral relationship, that is just the ante into the relationship. We are all showing up to the partnership and going to give extraordinary service. Okay? So that won't be enough, at least in my relationships, 
to do business. If they're not wanting to come from a place of contribution, if they're not wanting to grow, if they're not willing to ask the questions that are going to bubble up the referrals, then I'm going to find a new strategic partner that will. So they have to have the desire and the commitment. And they have to be able to ask that question. Now, I'm going to show you here in a moment, there are different questions for different professionals. The, the other point uh, I do want to make before I go on to that is, there are certain situations where you can create opportunities to connect. You know, like I told you a moment ago, I can't get out of a meeting with Mary Lou without her trying to connect me with somebody. Okay? But you don't always have the opportunity to see people or talk to them. So what else could you do? How about allowing that CPA to be to guest author an article in the newsletter to, that goes to your sphere of influence? Now what you've done is expose that CPA to your entire database maybe to your farm, if you're mailing it to that as well. And if that CPA is of the right mindset, he or she is then going to ask you to do the same. Or you're going to show them how you could. By offering up an article, real estate related, that ties into some taxable event. All right, so how many people do we want in this network? We want 25 is the goal. And I'm gonna give you the top 25 that you want. You wanna make sure that these 25 professionals have at least 200 people in their database, which by the way, what is it gonna take for you to qualify to get in this group? You gotta add 200, right? You must have been a rocket scientist before this. No, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. So you need to have a database, and it needs to have at least 200. 20. So that will give your network 5,000 people. How many realtors are in this network? One. How frequently do people move in years? What'd you say, Matthew? Ten in California. Let's use ten to be conservative. How many moves a year is that? Yes, it's five hundred. You're not gonna get all those. So I'll tell you about how many you can get. And I and I did tell you, by the way that that's just the list side, right? I'm gonna to suggest to you that a reasonable capture rate is 10%. That is if you do everything I'm asking you to do in these 45 minutes. Because you're not likely to do that, if you just do 25% of this, you can add an extra deal a month. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to preempt an objection that you're likely to encounter. So I know I was meeting with a CPA. I live in Oregon now, so I was meeting with him in Battleground, Washington. And he had two professionals he worked with in Washington that uh, were competing with me. And I, and I was introduced to this guy because I was told that this was one of those rare CPAs who was actually a really good professional networker. So I was all excited, but also knowing that I had two competitive peers in Washington, I also recognized that he would want to honor those relationships. So what did I do? I asked him, how many of your clients, well, first of all, do you do business in Oregon, which is where I live? 
And how many of your clients are there? It's 200 clients in Oregon. So that's 20 sales a year. That's not that bad. I says, so I said to him, why don't you continue to honor your Washington-based relationships? And how about if you just introduce me to your folks in Oregon that would want to buy or sell a home? And he agreed to that. And I said, and by the way, I will introduce my Washington-based clients to you, but not my Oregon. And the reason why I chose to arrange it in that way is because he is in Washington. So I want it to be convenient for my clients, and I want to have a strategic relationship in Oregon. So one of the things that I'm doing in that relationship is I'm trying to figure out where I can be of value to him, and I'm setting expectations that we're both agreeable to, and, and he was. And that, that relationship's been great. And within one week, by the way, that guy also introduced me to a highly successful financial advisor. Oh, oh I had a real time runner up there. The reason why I did that was because of these 25 professionals, there are two different groups of professionals. There are what I call asset-based professionals, and there are home improvement professionals. So with an asset-based professional, I think of that as a CPA, a financial advisor, attorney, of which there are several different kinds that can refer you. I had an agent, by the way, in Colorado, they got 13 referrals in one year from a bankruptcy attorney. Okay? So when you do this, I'm assuming I'm mostly talking to realtors here, my suggestion to you is to align with a lender that is network savvy, wants to grow, has a behavior characteristics of a connector, comes from a place of contribution, under promises, over delivers. Then, you're going to task that lender with aligning the asset-based professionals. Which are these. Financial planner, and on the attorneys, it's bankruptcy, estate, probate, uh, unfortunately, divorce is a really good one too. Uh, statistically, I think something like 52% of the time, someone has a divorce at home, so. You, as the realtor, are gonna line up the home improvement people. The way you figure out who you're gonna align with is you're gonna ask yourself, what are the trigger events for listing a home. One of the things that Brent mentioned at the beginning of our talk is we're gonna teach you how to get more listings. How many of you have noticed in your normal sphere of influence communication that you get more buyer referrals than seller referrals? Is that a true? It is. I'm here to tell you, if you train these affiliates, properly, you're going to get listing referrals from them. Can anybody tell me what percentage of the time that someone is painting a home that they're preparing it for sale? What's a good guess? 25. 25 is what I believe to be true. So why, why does somebody paint a home? There's three reasons. They're preparing for sale, there's deferred maintenance, or they just bought it and they want to fix it up. So one could make the argument that 33% of the time that someone's painting a home, they're preparing it for sale. I say 25 because I want it to be, I want under promise for you, okay? Now, it's not enough to be in a referral relationship with a painter. By the way, 
How many of you in the last 12 months have gotten this same referral from a painter? Okay. Do you see how you're not going to have a lot of competition in this regard? Okay, I was coaching an agent in Colorado. It was June, year to date. He had listed three homes from a painter. And the reason why is because he taught his painter to ask what prompted the person to paint their home. So, step one, identify the professionals, and I'm giving you the list here, of that are trigger events for selling a home, and then train those people to ask the right question. If it is an asset-based professional, the question is, remember the CPA? Do you plan to buy or sell a home in the next tax year? If it is a home improvement professional, the question is, may I ask what prompted you to paint your home? You know, because if you're going to sell it right away, we're going to certainly use a quality paint, but we may not want to choose the most expensive. And we're going to do a fine job, but we may not go to the same detail that we would if you tell us that you're going to be here for another 10 years. Okay, so if your painter said that to you, wouldn't you be thinking, gee, you know, this painter's kind of got to go on one. Right? That's what the consumer is thinking. So just like the CPA should be asking that question, when you train these professionals to ask these questions, they are going to be held in a higher esteem by their clients. Okay, homeowner's insurance. They, those agents, are notorious for asking referrals and not giving them. <laughs> they will say to you that Gosh, I'd like to refer you, but I always find out about the deal right at the last minute. You ever heard that? All the time. Okay. So, a couple questions for the insurance person. How many households do you serve? You want to be in business aligned with someone that has 500 or more. Next question for them is, how many policies do you have in force? You're looking for someone that has a two to one or better ratio. The reason why that's an important question is because the higher the ratio is reveals how relational they are. If they only have 1.25, 1.5 clients per household, they're not going deep in those relationships. They're a transactional agent. If you want to build a referral-based business, you can't be involved with transactional professionals. So, remember our math. If that insurance guy or gal has 500 clients, they have a client listing their home for sale every week. Do you know that the insurance professional is legally obligated to renew the policy every year. So they, unlike us realtors, who often will not stay in touch, they're actually legally obligated to stay in touch. What you need to do is align yourself with a professional that calls a client for the renewal. Farmers, actually, Farmers Insurance has a term for it, they call it the Farmers Friendly Review. That is code for, I'm going to try to upsell you a policy when we renew yours. Is that not true? All right. Don't try to screw with their farmers for the review. All you need to do is just ask them to, after they've done their spiel, whatever it is that they do, they say this one thing. And that is, by the way, how are you liking your home? Are you settled in there a while? 
which is code for, are you going to sell it this year? That's it. That's all they have to ask. Okay, now the other objection you're going to get from the insurance person, because they are really tough, is, well, yeah, but I've got, you know, 12 realtors that I work with. By the way, in most cases, somewhere between 50 and 60% of the business is unattached. 40 to 50% is attached to a referral relationship. And so, preempt that objection by saying to them, and by the way, when you ask this question, you are definitely going to uncover referrals. If it happens to be tied to a relationship that is continuing, be sure to take it back to that person. I only want you to call me up with the opportunities for that 40% that is unattached. And no, just by the way, once you demonstrate that you're doing this, I'm going to start introducing you to other real estate professionals that are non competitive with me. I'm a realtor. I'll introduce you to a few lenders, some that do over 100 transactions a year. And I'm going to let them know that this is a discipline that you practice. Would you like to grow your business? Okay? And that last little piece might be just enough to get them to do this. Property management, I don't know how, if you guys can read that all the way back, but number 10 is property management. Okay, so there's a, there's a trick little deal about these professionals. I was coaching an agent in Elmerado Hills one time. She's a very successful agent. And I said to her, uh, hey, do you have a, uh, do you have a pool person, you know, that does the home, the uh, pool resurfacing? And she goes, oh yeah, I've got a great pool guy. And I go, well good. Okay, so I want you to train him to ask the question, what's prompting you to resurface the pool? Because, or, or why are you canceling, why are you going to be canceling your pool service, right? And she goes, well, my pool guy is married to the top realtor in our town. And I'm like, Dana, actually, is her name. She's a sweetheart, so I'll say it. <coughs> Dana, that guy's never going to refer you a deal for the rest of your life. Yeah, but he gives me two free pool services when I refer, so I can give those out to clients. So what is it? What does a cleaning go for, Dana? About 75 bucks. So that's $150 value. What's the average commission in your area? It's over 15,000. Okay, do you see how that math doesn't really work? Okay, so when you're having this conversation with these affiliates, part of determining your alignment is you've got to ask the question, Dimitri, is there any reason why you can't refer me? I, you know, are you married to a realtor? Is your best friend a realtor? You know, it's a, it's a simple, easy question. And a surprising number of times, because there's a lot of licensees in the state of California, uh, they're going to say, well, as a matter of fact, okay, they're fired. No hard feelings. But you've got to align somebody with somebody that at least would have the possibility of referring. Because you don't want the guy ending up on the couch. All right. So these were, well, there were 16 there, I guess. Um, if, you, uh, if you want the complete list of 25, oh, oh I'm sorry, the. Um, I 16 home improvement people, and there's uh, about nine asset-based professionals, so that's better 25. All right, one of the things that you heard me say a few minutes ago was you only want to do business with a home insurance person that is going to call their clients for the renewal. So that's one of the qualifying questions, right? Okay, so remember I said to you, 
You've got to lead by example. So it's not enough to have 200 people in your database. It's not enough to mail them something. In order for you to qualify to be in your own network, what you're going to need to do is call once a quarter. Okay, so there are about 200 working days in a quarter. There's actually about 250. So how many calls are we going to have to make in order to call once a quarter? It's three to four calls a day. Okay? It's not a big deal. By the way, only one or two of those people are actually going to answer the phone. This is not a big time commitment, but it does need to be something that is committed to and time blocked. When you are training your professionals to refer you, and I actually prefer the word introduce you, one of the things that and, you, and this holds true for your sphere of influence as well. What you say to them is, I do not want you to be my salesperson. Right? I want you to be my eyes and ears and identify needs that I may serve. Right? Because a lot of these professionals, particularly the home improvement professionals, they are not very good salespeople. So you don't want them to do that. But I'm going to tell you the big reason why, and I'm going to suggest you read a book here in a minute, is that if they do attempt to sell you 50% of the time, the consumer is going to say, well, gee, Don, uh, sounds terrific, but I already know a realtor, and if that doesn't work out, I'd be happy to talk with them. 25% of the time, they're going to say, Boy, Don sounds great, give me his information, you will, and they won't call him. How many of us have had somebody say, Hey, did you get a call from John Doe? You know that guy that was going to list a $500,000 home in Folsom? Has anyone ever had that communication? Yeah. Right? And it's extremely frustrating. <coughs> And it's not, by the way, because that person that took that information was intentional in deciding not to call. It's because the average consumer engages with 14 realtors in the process of buying a home. They're everywhere. Okay? And so they ran into a realtor before they called you. So you're out of luck. So you want them to be your eyes and ears call you, hey Dimitri, I was meeting with the Joneses, they are painting their home, they're moving to San Diego, would you please give them a call, tell them that you have Don Yoko as a mutual acquaintance, and that you promised me that you would call them. That's a phrase you want to write down. We have a mutual acquaintance in Don Yoko. I promised Don I would give you a call. Does that not sound like you're going to be coming from a place of service that you are doing Don a favor? Okay? If it is done in that way, you're not going to get all the deals. But you're going to get back 100% of the time. Now, if you reach the person and they say, well, I already know a realtor. Whoever it is, you're going to say, well, that's wonderful. Don just wanted to make sure that you were being taken care of. As a matter of fact, I know Marguerite. She is amazing, and I'm sure she's going to do a great job for you. You ever violate that? It will get back to the person, and you will lose that referral source. <clears throat> Marguerite talked about the personalized handwritten notes. I hope that you got the point that I second that. 
I talked to you about the like, appreciation events, the mastermind. Here's another thing worth writing down. You will be judged by the quality of questions that you ask. So what you're looking for your professionals to do is ask one of two questions to refresh the asset-based professional question is are you going to buy or sell a home in the coming year different professionals are going to ask it I, I, i've taught you how to train a cpa and a home insurance person but basically the premise is they're going to ask if they're going to buy or sell in the coming year the question for the home improvement professional is what has prompted you to fill in the blank? Okay, so what is a trigger that's most likely to be a precursor to listing a home? I told you painting. What's another one? Landscaping. Landscaping. What's another one? Canceling service. Canceling pool service or resurfacing the pool. Okay, another one? Junk removal, yeah, absolutely. Carpet. How about flooring? Yeah. Roofing? Light remodeling? Cancel uh, pest control. By the way, do you know, you know those guys that spray? You know, they kind of spray every 90 days so that the bugs, so anyway. Yes. I've talked to a few of those guys. Do you know how many people the average person sprays. Hmm. They do 400. In a month? No, a quarter. Oh, okay. okay. So my point is, remember our math? <coughs> I actually had lunch at a Chipotle with an owner of a gas company, and I go, well, when people call in to cancel their service, do you ask them why? And, of course, as an owner, he usually does. But, as an owner, he doesn't usually answer the phone. I go, but could you train that person to ask that question? Really easy. And actually, it might be informative to them in other ways as well. This is a book, I still think, the absolute best book on professional referrals. I encourage you to get it. It's by Bob Burke. He is the gentleman that taught me the way that you want to be introduced. There's a process there. And I went, that's where I learned the four referrals turn into one if you have them trying to sell you. All right, my closing thought. <coughs> Brent, and especially Marguerite, alluded to you that we are approaching the end of this real estate cycle. Some of us have been through a few of those cycles. Some of you have never seen a real correction. I'm here to tell you that there's going to be a correction. I don't know exactly when that's going to be. I'm also here to tell you that this correction is going to be different. I don't think it will be as severe as the 2008 crash. I do think that these coming years will be as challenging, if not more so, for the real estate professionals than the 2008 crash. And the reason why is because we're not only going to have a correction, but we have an infiltration of technology and AI in the future that is going to automate processes, cause commission compression. And so if you 
Do not choose a relationship-based approach to your business. And you play to the hand of the technology companies and do business in a transactional way. You are not likely to be part of our real estate community in five years. Okay? Now the good news is there will be a lot less realtors in five years. So you're going to have a lot less competition. And I'm here to suggest that those less standing are going to be the ones that under-promised, over-delivered, showed up on time, said please and thank you, and did business in a relationship-based way. So that's my closing thought. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, John. Thank you. Wow, was that good stuff? Yeah. yeah. We were back there talking like he's an absolute tech kitchen, man. He's just coming and he's just not thinking about it. I love it. Spend time to work on your business, not just in it. You guys did that today. I applaud all of you. I'm preaching to the bars. A bunch of us are going to the lazy dog at the restaurant in the parking lot. It's huge. If you want to grab some food and hang out for 30, 40 minutes if you're hungry. Also at 2 o'clock today in Guild Mortgage, I'm doing a lunch to learn, so lunch is provided there as well at 2 o'clock. It's in an hour and 10 minutes. Wait. What time is it? That's 12.48. No, I didn't move my, my watch ahead an hour. <laughs> I'm still I'm, I'm back an hour ago. Well, we got out early. <laughs> good. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Marguerite. That was awesome. Also, James, what is the date in April 25th? Okay, here we go. This is technology. We brought in the number one guy in the country from KB Corp. It's costing us thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars uh, for this event. It's going to be April 9th through the 12th. We are not charging you. You need to come for free. We're paying. We'll probably spend uh, five to eight thousand dollars on airplanes, hotels, fees. It is going to be April 25th, one day. 9 to noon. It's going to be here in this room. This guy is the tech lead generation guy. They have thousands of agents across America that pay that company 600 a month with one year contracts. And we make this website and LP this platform for $50 a month, no contract. He's going to teach you how to generate leads using the future of AI and bots and everything. It's a big, big, big deal. So you're going to get to sign up for this. I'm sure we'll find out an event, right? The room will be packed with lined around the corners. This is huge. This is the future. Don't miss it. April 25th, 9th, and right here in this room. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.